I think we're now um, uh, underway. So, uh, uh, welcome to um, all our panelists and uh, to uh, anyone who is uh, viewing this uh, session uh, online, uh, either in real time or um, uh, after this um, uh, conference has come to an end. Um, this, this is uh, a conference is part of a series uh, of uh, conferences organized by the Project for Peaceful Competition at uh, King's College London, uh, which has brought together a global academic uh, network to consider issues that relate to uh, geopolitics and geoeconomics as, as uh, we face them at present, in particular the relationships between uh, uh, China and uh, the West, but also not forgetting that we live in a multipolar world with many other uh, uh, countries and powers involved. Um, and uh, we've been trying to discuss a whole series of issues that uh, relate to those relationships. Uh, uh, one of those is the question of the, uh, the modes of discussion between uh, different powers. And one of those is uh, uh, BRICS, um, which is uh, an important grouping about which uh, many uh, people around the world know uh, relatively little. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we're really delighted that uh, we've been able to assemble with the great help of Chebri, to whom we have uh, uh, enormous gratitude, uh, a, a group of distinguished speakers representing each one of them, uh, not representing, but uh, speaking from the perspective of each one of the uh, members of the, uh, of the uh, BRICS grouping. Um, and uh, uh, that's all I really need to say. And I uh, now hand over um, uh, to, uh, our, so to speak, our host from uh, uh, Chebri, um, uh, Ambassador Lima. Good morning or afternoon to all. It is great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. This conference is co-organized, as uh, Sir Oliver just said, by Sebri. Uh, the Brazilian Center for International Relations and the Policy Institute at King's College London. And on behalf of SEBRI, I would like to warmly thank uh, uh, King's College London and Sir Oliver Latwin for our fruitful partnership. We are also uh, particularly grateful to our audience for, for joining us and uh, the renowned speakers who have agreed to share their insights with us today. SEBRI has had the chance uh, to organize a previous event within the Project for Peaceful Competition in May 2022, which focused on one of the main issues on which global cooperation is needed, namely sustainability and the new energy economy. Today's event is organized by SEBRI's Asia program. It further contributes to the project by investigating the role of BRICS as a mechanism to deepen cooperation among countries and to reinforce multilateralism. In my career, I have had the opportunity to act as BRICS Sherpa from 2014 to 2016, and the privilege to contribute in this capacity to the creation of the NDB, the, the, the New Development Bank, which is uh, arguably the uh, BRICS uh, greatest achievement. Uh, today, we will be hearing uh, the perspective of uh, the perspectives actually of uh, academics, uh, experts, diplomats on the dynamics of BRICS, how it has evolved over time and whether it is a useful forum to address uh, major global challenges. We have the pleasure of receiving special guests from around the world to share their thoughts from a Brazilian, Russian, uh, Indian, Chinese and South African perspective. So thank you again to all who are watching and to the participants. We hope you enjoy the discussion. I will now give the floor to Feliciano Guimarães, Academic Director at SEBRI and Professor of International Relations at Sao Paulo University to introduce our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Ambassador Grassalima mentioned, my name is Feliciano Guimarães. I'm the Academic Director of SEBRI and I'm also Professor of International Relations at the University of Sao Paulo. It's a pleasure to be here to be, I'll be the moderator of this uh, uh, discussion. And I, I thank you very much to uh, the Policy Institute, the King's College of London for the partnership with SEBRI on this uh, very interesting subject. 
So I, I will now introduce our first speaker to, to set the scene is uh, my dear friend, Professor Carlos Milani from uh, State University of Rio de Janeiro. Carlos Milani is one of Brazil's most distinguished academics. It's, it's something that I'm always looking up to and I, I admire so much uh, his work. Um, uh, he, he coordinates two research centers at the State University of Rio, the World Political Analysis Laboratory, as we call here in Portuguese, Lab Mundo, and the Interdisciplinary Observatory on Climate Change. His research agenda includes Brazilian co and comparative foreign policy, international development cooperation, South-South relations, human rights, and climate change. And his latest books are Solidarity and Interest, Motivations and Strategy in International Development Cooperation, 2018, Brazilian Cooperation Agency, 30 Years of History and Future Ch uh, Challenge, 2017, and Atlas of Brazilian Defense Policy, 2017, and Atlas of Brazilian Foreign Policy, 2016. So it's a pleasure to have everyone, everyone here. And I, I give the floor back to you, Professor Milani. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Thanks a lot, uh, Feliciano. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sabri, for the invitation. Um, it's uh, really nice to be here with uh, Sir Oliver Latwin, Ambassador Graça Lima, of course, my dear colleague and friend Feliciano Guimarães, and all these fellow researchers and diplomats from the BRICS countries. I was asked by Sabri to uh, uh, deal with uh, the guiding questions of today's debate, uh, which are, uh, as uh, presented in the project document, can the West cooperate with the East, particularly with China, in view of a peaceful future? And can the BRICS group be helpful in view of a peaceful future order? Of course, such uh, questions uh, may lead to manifold answers presenting several layers of complexity. Peaceful competitions also involve geopolitics and conflicts of interests, even the Olympics. So can we imagine peaceful competitions that are not the Olympics? They also involve geopolitics, of course. That is why I hereafter summarize uh, some uncertainties, what I would call uncertainties, that are present in the international scenario, in my perspective, in five uh, macro phenomena that associated uh, with each other may reflect the central realignments currently underway in the global order, which challenge multilateral organizations uh, their capacity to act and to respond to challenges, and also the BRICS grouping in terms of adaptation and proposal of innovations uh, in the institutional reforms of these multilateral organizations. The first uh, uh, uncertainty uh, is the hegemonic uh, dispute uh, between the US and China and the resulting transition scenarios on the international chessboard. Of course, many scenarios are possible. Graham Allison in his book from uh, 2017 presented several possibilities between diplomacy, peaceful transition and war. And there are many gray zones in the middle which uh, this project is dealing with, of course. The second uncertainty has to do with the war in Ukraine and Russia's role in international politics independently of the views that we may have on the interests that players and actors have in this war, it's definitely something extremely relevant for international security, particularly for uh, security in Europe. The third uh, uncertainty, I would say, comes from the political economy uh, dimension of the international order. And it is uh, dealing with the continuous process of uh, autonomization of global finances in the design of what appears to be the new capitalism of the 21st century. Uh, this new capitalism, which generates systemic financial crisis, it has been doing so since the 1990s, including in central countries and strong commercial and technological repercussions. The recent bankruptcy uh, processes involving the Silicon Valley Bank and the Credit Suisse are yet again an expression of that critical and structural dimension 
of this crisis. And of course, econo econ economics and, and, and politics, they are together in uh, these uh, challenges to unfold new orders uh, in the international scenario. The fourth uncertainty, I'm being very, uh, I'm summarizing, right? I know that each of this uncertainty uh, may be uh, developing 30 minutes at least, but I only have 15 minutes to make this uh, very short uh, introduction. That's why I go directly to my fourth uncertainty, which relates to the threats to democratic institutions in key Western countries and in some countries of the global South. The fifth uh, uncertainty, uh, which is perhaps uh, the more encompassing one because it comes from outside the political and the economic spheres of the international scenario, has to do with the crisis of the Anthropocene, including the climate emergency, the acceleration of biodiversity loss, and health pandemic crisis as a very complex multidimensional phenomenon outside the political constituted international system, but with a significant impact on the reorganization of multilateralism. Bearing this very complex scenario in mind, I argue that the political reconstruction of multilateral organizations, including for the purpose of preparing international organizations, states and societies to provide effective responses to future crises, be they environmental, climate related, health related, financial crisis, presupposes at least three uh, uh, orders of factors. The first one is confronting the current crisis of democracy in domestic political sphere of many countries in the West and in the global South, of course. Second, it implies dealing with the necessary redefinition of the relationships between nature and society, between the state and the markets, in the implementation of public policies for sustainable development, but truly sustainable development at the national and international levels. And thirdly, accepting the diversity of values across sovereign nations in order to craft new framings for responsibility and collective action globally, regionally, uh, within the UN and uh, within other regional uh, and interregional groupings. What can the BRICS do in this regard, in my perspective? First, I think we need to acknowledge uh, that China and Russia are key competitors with Western powers in economic and strategic terms. This bears important implications to understand the nature of this geopolitical competition, if we want it to be peaceful. Any peaceful solution to any crisis implies listening to both China and Russia. Secondly, uh, the West is heterogeneous, and so is the East, and so is the BRICS grouping, of course. We have five countries so far in the BRICS grouping. Uh, they are very heterogeneous. This doesn't mean that they cannot act together in order to craft uh, new norms, to define new institutions, as the New Development Bank is an empirical evidence of this process. In spite of heterogeneity across the countries, they have been able to craft a new institution uh, uh, in the field of uh, international political economy. Uh, the need, though, I think, uh, uh, I think there is a need, though, to bring uh, societies in, in order to avoid, to avoid a strictly traditional vision of geopolitics at the service of state enterprise in defining the roadmap to a future peaceful competition. Even Graham Allison, uh, whom I mentioned at the very beginning of my speak, uh, opens avenues of cooperation in order to avoid to see this trap in his book. Bertrand Badia in France also makes an invitation in one of his more, most recent book uh, to acknowledge uh, international relations also as intersocial relations. 
That's why I uh, really argue that there is a need for the BRICS grouping, grouping to bring more societies into uh, the discussions and the debates of uh, what the grouping should look like in the future. Thirdly, uh, the BRICS countries should play a role in redefining the rules of the game in multilateral institutions. They should not abandon uh, this endeavor to maintain the UN institutions as a pivotal negotiating sphere. The UN, in all its diversity, in spite of all the institutional shortcomings, is, in my very modest view, still the best way possible to think of reforms and improvements in collective decision making. To conclude, let me emphasize that the domestic international interplay of countries uh, is very relevant in all these challenges. Let me conclude with uh, a little bit of a focus on the Brazilian experience. Brazil's experience in uh, 2019, when it held the rotating presidency of the BRICS uh, group, uh, and internally having Ambassador Ernesto Araujo as Minister of Foreign Affairs, clearly illustrates the difficult balance between internal and external dimensions of foreign policy. In that regard, Brazil may still be confronted with interesting challenges soon. Let me recall that uh, in 2024, Brazil will host the G20, and in 2025, Brazil will hold the rotating presidency of the BRICS group again. China is a central trading partner and investment partner for Brazil. The US-Brazil bilateral relations are very relevant to fight the extreme right networks organized transnationally across the Americas if we really want to make the promotion of democracy, a true value across the Americas. China is structurally extremely important to Brazil, but so is the United, States, United States of America. However, I would uh, dare say that Russia, a member of a key member of the uh, BRICS group, a key member of the international system, may also pose some acute challenges that could leave Brazil and I would say, but this I'll leave for Ambassador Graça Lima to deal with, but uh, leave Brazil and Itamaraty uh, in a more perhaps uncomfortable position. For instance, uh, uh, during Brazil's presidency of the BRICS uh, in 2025, uh, what will the Brazilian justice system do in view of a possible visit, official visit of President Putin due to the International Criminal Court's mandate against him. Brazil has fully uh, recognized uh, the mandate uh, of the International Criminal Court. Uh, there is also an official visit being prepared by uh, Brazil uh, and Russia of President uh, Putin to Brazil. Uh, and there is this mandate of the International Criminal Court against uh, President Putin. This may pose very acute uh, uh, critical problems to the Brazilian diplomacy and uh, to the diplomacy within the BRICS group, which I think uh, are extremely important in the short uh, term. I will leave uh, uh, at there and uh, give the floor back to Feliciano to continue this debate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Carlos. It's always great to hear you. You, you give us a very very interesting and compassing uh, overview of the of the five uh, uncertainties uh, uh, of the international arena. I think is a very good is very good for setting the scene you know, of our discussion. So, the, our next speaker <clears throat> is in bed. Let me just get my my notes here. Is Ambassador Sarkis from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, whose uh, uh, presentation title is uh, from a Brazilian point of view, what has BRICS delivered both vis-a-vis -vis China in terms of Brazil geopolitical positioning. Ambassador Sarkis um, has a very uh, a long career at Itamaraty, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He holds a degree in electronic engineering from Polytechnic School of Federal University of Rio. 
uh, and a master's and doctorate, doc doctorate in economics from London School of Economics, LS LSC. He joined the Foreign Service in Brazil in 1991, and during his career as a diplomat, he held several positions, particularly in the area of economic trade and financial diplomacy. He was responsible for negotiations, economic policy analysis in the areas of international trade, investment, and finance in Amarachi. And he represented the Brazilian government in several intergovernment meetings and conferences at OACD, WTO, World Bank, IMF, and the United Nations. During his uh, career, uh, he served in the Brazilian embassies of London from 1997 to 2000, Berlin. And he was also Minister of uh, Council for Economic and uh, OACD Affairs at the Embassy of Brazil in Paris from 2009 to 2014, as well as a Minister Council on the Embassy of Tokyo from 2014 and 17. In prior, prior to assuming his position uh, of Secretary for uh, Foreign Trade and Economics Affairs and Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2010, he was the Vice President for Risk Research and Strategy and Partnerships at the New Development Bank in Shanghai from 2018 to 2020. Uh, Ambassador Sarkis, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, and he, I give the floor uh, to you. You have uh, 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Feliciano. It's a great honor, great pleasure to be there uh, with you today. Let me first thank uh, Sabri and King's College, particularly uh, Sir Oliver Latwin, and my former boss uh, and friend, Ambassador José Alfredo Graça Lima. Uh, uh, I will speak on a personal capacity uh, thank you, Feliciano, for uh, introducing uh, myself. I would say uh, in the last almost three years, I've been uh, Brazil Sherpa at the G20 and the BRICS. I'm still Brazil Sherpa at the G20. Uh, another colleague uh, took over from me the Sherpa position uh, uh, at uh, the BRICS, uh, and this uh, leaves me more comfortable uh, in speaking today uh, on a personal capacity. I will try to benefit from my experience at the New Development Bank and as Sherpa of BRICS uh, and also as Sherpa uh, at the G20 in particular. Well, first, let me uh, say a few words about multilateralism. Then I will say something about the groups, G20, BRICS uh, and G7 and eventually uh, try to sketch ideas about, you know, how the BRICS uh, has contributed to multilateralism and the way forward uh, eventually. Well, I will take the definition of multilateralism as a universal project, uh, very much inspired by the UN Charter and uh, multilateral fora, for, such as the WTO and other uh, institutions. Of course, there is a, a definition of multilateralism, particularly by Ruji and also by Kyohane, uh, that multilateralism would be an arrangement among three or more uh, states uh, willing to pursue uh, coordination, cooperation on the basis of agreed uh, principles and rules. I think we have to be amb ambitious. Uh, there is an, an idealism behind the idea of universal multilateralism. And I think this is the topic we are addressing uh, today. I will not have time to elaborate on the uh, development of multilateralism as uh, Carlos Milani uh, rightly pointed out. There are many threats, many downside risks to multilateralism coming from different sources. And I think Brazilian diplomacy has been traditionally very much attached to multilateralism. And I feel proud of that. I, I, I feel always motivated to be engaged in that work. And as I would try to explain, I do see a role for BRICS and other groups uh, in that matter. I think they are part of the process. As you can see, uh, my approach to multilateralism is not a, a Kantian one. Uh, in the sense that it's not a static project, it's not only about agreeing on, on rules uh, for multilateral institution, either in a liberal sense or in a different sense. It's, it's kind of a Hegelian uh, historical construct. Uh, 
in multilateral fora are historical in the same sense, states, nation states, they are. Uh, I will stop there uh, in this regard. But uh, as you can see, uh, my approach to multilateral here today is one that uh, is willing to consider historical uh, factors and also the heterogeneity uh, in the, within the international community. An, inter, an heterogeneity that uh, is pretty much diverse and evolving over time. So uh, countries have to reconcile with the multilateral rules. They have to identify their interests, their objectives uh, continuously within that environment. And they are exposed to shocks, they are exposed to crisis, financial crisis, and so on and so forth. Uh, as you know, G20 uh, has been an important, uh, sorry, G7 has been historically, more historically, an important group uh, in contributing to multilateralism. Uh, it was created after uh, the break of the the original Bretton Woods uh, understanding uh, led by US. Eventually G G7 countries, they, they regarded themselves as the anchor of the financial system, the stability of the global economy. And they worked as such uh, for, a, for many decades. Uh, and here, here we have to be, you know, very much synthetic uh, and summarize history. Uh, the emergence of BRICS and G20 uh, more or less, uh, is, is more or less simultaneously. Uh, of course, there is a sequencing of events, uh, but both respond to the need of uh, reform of at least of the international financial architecture. And why? Because at least by G7, they were perceived as important forces uh, in reconfiguring uh, the financial system, uh, reconfiguring some issues related to development. Recently, we have seen in the G20 important debates about uh, that uh, in LDCs, in developing countries, and the need to engage uh, China and other emerging countries in that debate. Uh, this has been expanding, uh, and that's why G20 has been expanding and also BRICS uh, has been uh, expanding a lot. So I see these groups as uh, especially uh, premier forum uh, of coordination on economic affairs, uh, development and economic financial cooperation. Uh, the groups that I refer to uh, G20 as a more encompassing one, encompassing both uh, G7 and BRICS and these two latter groups, I think they are expression of uh, a multipolar uh, context. They are multipolar forces. You can see them as a unity, as part of multipolarity, or as a group gathering uh, multi multipolar forces. Uh, of course, uh, they operate on the basis of uh, diverse uh, geometries, depending on the topic, uh, depending uh, on the specific uh, issue. Uh, so there is uh, uh, an important dynamic interaction between G7 and BRICS in the reform process of the international financial architecture. And I would also argue there is this a similar dynamic of interaction within G20, between these two groups, within multilateral fora, not only with regard to international financial uh, architecture reform, but also more broadly uh, in the area of sustainable development. And this has been clear and clear since countries, the international community agreed multilaterally on the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda at the UN. Uh, to me, uh, the great contributions of the BRICS, to be uh, brief, I see I, I only have one and a half minute, uh, uh, has been concentrated in these uh, 
three areas. First, South-South cooperation. They are enhancing the BRICS countries. They are enhancing mutual knowledge. Uh, they are enhancing exchanges between peoples and so on and so forth. Uh, more systematically uh, within the sphere of multilateralism, they have been contributing to the reform of the international and monetary system. I will not have time to elaborate further on that, but you have seen reforms of IMF quotas. There is an important debate about the role of MDBs. Uh, Janet Yellen has made strong speech about that. Uh, this is the US view, perhaps uh, reflecting also views of G7 countries. Uh, we have to complement that with the views of uh, the BRICS, of the emerging economies. Uh, the bulk of the needs in SDGs still reside, uh, concentrate in the emer emerging developing world. Uh, and the BRICS has been an important facilitator, an important instrument to leverage concerns, uh, not only uh, political concerns, to be part powerful forces in the process, but to raise the awareness about the needs in sustainable infrastructure, uh, in food, uh, poverty, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are the three areas uh, in which BRICS, I think, have managed to persuade. Uh, it's an important group contributing uh, among themselves contributing to multilateralism, complementing the work of G7, enhancing the role of G20 as a multipolar process uh, to uh, strengthen uh, multilateralism. I see these forces as important today, especially today, uh, given the threats, the, the threats of fragmentation of uh, the multilateral institutions. Uh, a threat that is clear, for instance, uh, in the WTO, but also in other international uh, multilateral uh, fora. Uh, allow me also finally to stress NDB. Uh, I think Ambassador Grassalina said arguably uh, the most, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, significant contribution uh, of, of the BRICS. I, I see it at least in, in tangible terms as the most uh, significant. And I see NDB very much an institution with principles that are in line with the SDGs, in line with the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And, and, and this uh, indicates to us the way forward uh, for the contribution of BRICS to multilateralism. The principles would be, uh, I, I will summarize, demand-driven process. So it's up to countries to demand uh, uh, contributions from MDBs, uh, from countries that are willing to be partners, uh, to cooperate. Uh, cooperation should be demand-driven. Secondly, <clears throat> uh, we have to rely on country systems. Uh, and this goes with the third principle. Uh, countries are owner, should be owner of their sustainable development trajectories. Uh, and, 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 and fourth, this has to be consistent uh, with the SDGs, with the multilateral agreed uh, principles of the 2030 agenda. The NDCs, uh, eventually to address climate, uh, are also part of that, of countries determining uh, development trajectories. And uh, I see plenty of space for BRICS collaborating on the reform of the international financial architecture because we need to mobilize uh, resources. Not only we need to change the governance of the international financial architecture, but also we need to mobilize resources, multilateral resources, public sector resources, private sector resources to accelerate uh, the achievement of the SDGs within the BRICS and the developing world. So BRICS, G7, and all G20 countries, they have to work together and focus on cooperation and development. And this will be a resilient multipolar force uh, to uh, keep multilateralism, in the essence at least, intact. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ambassador Sarkis. It's always a pleasure to hear you as well, based on your vast experience in international negotiations. And uh, I think you, you summarize very well the, the goals of the NDB and emphasizing the, uh, the role of NDB as a BRICS most important uh, empirical contribution to the international uh, uh, order, order. I just would like to remind everyone that we have between here and the, our in the YouTube channel at several more than 100 people online. This is a, a record event, so it's going to be there in the YouTube uh, afterwards. And uh, usually our numbers triple after uh, the presentations are done. So more than 300 people probably hear uh, and listen to, to these presentations. Now, I'm going to pass uh, the word to Professor uh, Elizabeth Sidiropoulos, uh, Director of the South African Institute of International Affairs. She will uh, answer the question from a South African point of view, how productive is the engagement with China via BRICS and how does it compare with other forms of Sino-African engagement? Uh, Dr. Elizabeth C uh, Sidiropoulos is the Chief Executive of South African Institution of International Affairs. Her areas of expertise lie in South African foreign policy, African external powers, global governance, and South-South cooperation. Her most recent publications included co-edited vo uh, volumes on values, interests, and powers, South African Foreign Policy and Uncertain Times, published in 2020. The, the, the Palgrave uh, Handbook of Development Cooperation for Achieving the 2030 Agenda, published in 2021. And she's the editor-in-chief of South African Journal of International Affairs. Just a, a, a quote we created recently, a year ago, the Brazilian uh, Cerber Journal of International Affairs and the South African Journal of International Affairs is, was one of the, the journals that we took in consideration to sort of be uh, uh, inspired by to create our own journal here at Cerber. It is a policy-oriented peer review and interdisciplinary forum for discussion on South African, South African international affairs. And she's a regular commentator in South African and foreign media. In December 2020, she was appointed to serve on the UN Second High Level Advisory Board on Economic and Social Affairs. And she's uh, is a co-chair of the task force on the S SDGs and Indian think tank presidents in 2023. So Dr. Elizabeth, you have the floor. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Feliciano. And, and I'm going to convey your uh, your observations about the Sabri Journal also to my academic editor. She'll be very pleased uh, regarding the journal. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation both to, to Sabri and to King's College London and to Sir Oliver with whom we've been uh, corresponding on WhatsApp for during the pandemic, I think, Sir Oliver. Um, uh, it's great to, to be seeing these things come to the fore. Um, so I will, I mean, I'm very grateful both for uh, Carlos's uh, presentation and, and big picture, as well as for uh, Ambassador Sarkis's uh, uh, presentation on, on, on the BRICS. I think really both painted a, a, a very good um, uh, sort of broad overviews. Uh, and I'm going to be picking up on some of these, but we'll focus uh, quite a bit on, 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 on South Africa. And I think the point to make just uh, building on on the uh, on the presentations of, of the previous speakers is 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 really uh, four words which we can come back to or five words. Um, the first is multipolarity, and I think we need to understand uh, BRICS in that context. The second is is multilateralism, and we know that sometimes multilateralism uh, has layers of, of, uh, of, of, uh, that feed into the more formal multilateral processes. And I see certainly BRICS, and I think that was also what Ambassador Sarkis was saying, uh, BRICS, G7, G20 is, is very much part of that. The third word is heterogeneity. I think both, uh, both Carlos and Ambassador Sarkis referred to that. The fact is that, you know, we have certainly during the 90s and the early 2000s spoken about sort of universal, uh, creating universal frameworks. But I think we're increasingly realizing that we have to work with heterogeneity. So what, what does that mean? And, and I think the BRICS are part of that. And, and I would argue as well, the BRICS are having to work that out within the BRICS themselves, not just at the global, uh, at the global level. And then from a very uh, South African perspective, uh, clearly when we're thinking about the BRICS, 
uh, Africa is an important component and 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 south south cooperation which uh ambassador also also mentioned so let me uh with sort of using that as as an introduction then just uh just talk a little bit more specifically about south africa and the BRICS, and and a little bit on 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 china so if i just dive right into your question uh and say south africa has very good relations with china across fora um it's important to note that we have a comprehensive strategic partnership with China, which was signed in 2010 or 2011. Uh, China is our single largest trading partner, as, as is the case with, uh, with most countries these days, uh, if you exclude, of course, the European Union uh, as a block, as a common market. And, uh, and South Africa has also been a leading member, I think, from the African side on, uh, uh, in FOCAC, in the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which was established uh, 20 years ago by, more than 20 years ago by, by China to, uh, in, in, you know, as, as, a, as a platform bringing together all African states uh, uh, and, 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 and China. And I think we, we were chair, we were co-chairing the FOCAC uh, and, until I think 2018 or uh, until, uh, um, yeah, in the last five or six years, I, I forget now, it lasts over, over, over a three year period. Um, the, the relationship, obviously, the economic relationship is, 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 uh, um, is often one that sort of replicates the kinds of relationships that we see with Global North, Global South. Uh, perhaps a little less so in the, in, in, um, in, in the fact that uh, South Africa also has, has had historically quite a significant investment, uh, apart from tra trade in, in, in China, and has actually been an important uh, investor in, in China. And that's, that, that reflects really South Africa's particular economic um, uh, uh, situation. Um, let, me, let me just then come to the BRICS. I mean, what uh, South Africa, of course, was not one of the initial BRIC members. Um, and in that sense, while we're discussing uh, expansion of the BRICS this year, uh, South Africa was in effect the first expansion, uh, and, and this was something that happened under the Chinese presidency of, uh, of, of the BRICS, uh, although there are many stories about, uh, you know, who pushed and, 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 and who didn't uh, about that, but certainly we, we joined uh, the BRICS uh, during the China presidency in, 20, uh, in 2011. South Africa had been um, advocating for its membership of, of the BRICS from the time that the BRICS was, was, was created. Um, it was the only member of IPSA, remember IPSA, <laughs> uh, that was not part of the BRICS. And uh, I think it thought that um, it was important, to, certainly for the BRICS in terms of legitimacy, to have an African uh, state there. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that for South Africa, the BRICS is probably the most important club of which it is uh, a member. Uh, we have an interministerial uh, group uh, uh, that, that sort of manages and coordinates relations uh, uh, but between ministries on, on, on the BRICS. Then there are, of course, uh, the other institutions that other BRICS members also have, which are academic, which are the you know, South African BRICS uh, think tank uh, that sort of sits on the BRICS think tank, uh, think tank council. And there has been quite a bit of people to people uh, uh, sort of building up and, and, and ramping up of, uh, uh, of engagement. And I would argue that in some instances, if we, if we look at this, um, uh, not just in terms of our relations with China, but the BRICS has almost, uh, but also with other members, the BRICS has almost acted as a, as a catalyst for, for bilateral. And sometimes we supplant the bilateral with the multilateral. In other words, we're, we're engaging through the BRICS, BRICS forum and, and sometimes we, we, we tend to sort of leave to the side the bilateral. I, I'm not talking about South Africa specifically. And I think, I think that's, that's an important uh, thing to, to bear in mind. I, I think we need to not do the one and not, and, and not the other. But I think there's been, there's been a dimension of that. Um, I think it's also obviously, um, uh, I think the point I want to make about why the BRICS is so important is probably the most important uh, club for South Africa is that where we have an interministerial with the BRICS, we don't have one, for example, with the G20, which, which has also a fairly, well, in fact, you know, in many, in many ways, a much broader 
um, uh, agenda. And that is certainly something that has been in discussion in South Africa, but hasn't really been, uh, hasn't uh, been affected. Um, clearly, the importance of the BRICS, I think, varies among members, but certainly for South Africa, this is a big deal. We're playing with the big guys. You know, we're the little guy in terms of uh, in terms of economics, in terms of population. You know, the opportunity to be engaging with the Chinese president on a on a regular basis every year is is probably not something that everybody has the opportunity to do. Just to use one example. Um, but BRICS, very importantly, is is considered by South Africa as an important grouping that can also advance very specifically its its foreign some of its key foreign policy objectives. The first of these is is the issue of reform of of global governance. Um, it is about South South cooperation, which which South Africa is is very keen on, and clearly it also believes that. It's important in, in, a, in, a, in an environment where we are shifting from a hegemonic system that we need to be creating groupings that actually uh, are, are reflect this growing multipolarity. And so BRICS is seen very much as a mechanism for reform, as, as the ambassador uh, has also highlighted. Uh, and I would argue that the heft that the BRICS might have in that has a lot to do with, with China's presence there um, because of, of the size of its uh, economy, particularly in the area of, of financial and economic uh, global governance. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about one of the issues that we are debating at the moment in South Africa, uh, as uh, South Africa is chair of the BRICS uh, this year, which is uh, uh, really the issue of, of, of expansion. Um, the, the, the discussion was put on the table. Uh, well, it, the issue has been uh, uh, has been on the agenda uh, formally or informally at, at various points. And as I said, we were the first country that really uh, was 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 brought in. Um, the 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 last BRICS summit last year took a decision to really uh, consider this and to develop a, a terms of reference uh, uh, for the uh, for the possible expansion and to develop a set of criteria, principles, approaches. And, 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 and so on. And so South Africa is now as chair sort of investigating uh, what that might, what, uh, what form that might take. Is it going to be an organic approach? What role would countries from each region have in terms of bringing in new members? Um, but there is also a concern and certainly um, there is a concern in South Africa and I know other BRICS uh, countries have also been uh, concerned about the possibility of expansion and what that means for their respective voices and for their respective influence in such, in, in, in such a forum. Uh, so the issue of exclusivity is, uh, is an important element of it. We all want to be inclusive, but we also recognize that, you know, hey, if I'm the only African country there, that's, you know, that's kudos to me, um, and 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 I think that uh, and, and that gives me greater opportunity for influence than than the when the group expands and is diluted. I think what is interesting to note, and this comes to the point around uh, multipolarity and heterogeneity, is that there's been growing interest from the global south in this institution over the last uh, uh, a year or so, especially since the Ukraine war. I'm not quite sure whether there is, uh, but maybe there is uh, a, a linkage there. Apparently, some seven, seven countries have formally applied, seven have uh, uh, asked questions informally. In um, many certainly in the West in that context also have increasingly seen it, not just now, but I think over the, over the trajectory of the BRICS's development as a competitor. It's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a counterbalance. Certainly from a South African uh, perspective, it's often argued that the, it shouldn't be seen in that way. But I think clearly, as we move into a more geopolitical world, this is becoming increasingly difficult. And while sort of having different groupings with different interests and coming from different perspectives is one thing, a situation where you almost are at sort of contesting uh, uh, in, in, in a much more uh, polemical way is clearly not what helps uh, 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 peaceful competition. Um, I think from a South African perspective, just to come to, to, to your question specifically about what how we have benefited, um, uh, I think there are obviously systemic benefits, uh, which I've alluded to, which I think all of us are on the same page on. I think the NDB and the possibilities of, of, of financial, uh, of, of loans and grants through the NDB has been very important, certainly for 
uh, for South Africa. South Africa also sees the BRICS as potential uh, to, to uh, as a uh, uh, BRICS as a grouping to actually build up and improve uh, economic cooperation with the continent. I would argue that dimension is much more effective bilaterally, and so there isn't a BRICS sort of initiative on on Africa. Um, um, there is the importance of scientific cooperation uh, and research collaboration. And I think in that regard, certainly from a South African perspective, South Africa was really keen to see the establishment of the BRICS Vaccine Center. It was very keen to see it housed uh, in, in, in South Africa. Um, it's now been established in, in, in virtual form. And I think it really builds on, on the issues that South Africa and and India have taken up at the international at the international level around uh, vaccine manufacturing, developing the issue of intellectual property rights, and 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 so on and so forth. Um, I think I'm I'm going to come to an end because I'm sure I've run out of time. But I want to make two two observations here. Um, I think the first one is that there are obviously political differences. Uh, our interests are different in in different uh, fora. But disagreements in some areas hasn't meant that the BRICS can't actually work together in other areas. And I think that is one of the most important lessons that we need to take forward uh, as we discuss what are the mechanisms that can facilitate trust, cooperation, uh, uh, co uh, collaboration, even in a time of competition between uh, East and West, if we want to put it uh, uh, that way. Um, I think the it is critical for for the G7 and and in some ways the G7 is much more co, is much more coherent than the BRICS in terms of political outlook, economic uh, uh, systems, and so on. And and the fact that the BRICS can actually work together on a on a whole range of issues, uh, while not necessarily always agreeing on on everything. And in the case of, for example, an India and a China having border disputes. Um, and, and Russia, um, it, it, it says something about being able to work together on what we can and, and not allowing the differences to actually hijack the, uh, the other processes. And I say that also in the context of the G20, I was, I was quite uh, uh, happy to see that we in, in Bali, there was able to be a, a, a joint communique uh, now we're moving back into a situation where some of those challenges of adopting common positions on critical on critical global challenges on the on climate on the SDGs etc are, are are going to be uh, uh, sort of put to the side uh, because we we disagree on 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 on, on a particular issue. Um, let me let me stop there, and uh, I've got other points to make, but I'm sure we've got plenty of time to to make them. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, for for your presentation. I I really uh, thought of very interesting this uh, exclusivity versus inclusiveness of the the dilemma of of inviting more countries to join BRICS. I think this is something that we definitely are discussing here in Brazil. Yesterday, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mauro Vieira, gave an interview in which the interviewer asked him about this expansion of a BRICS, and the the, the reporter specifically mentions Argentina and uh, Iran and he's he, he like he tries to dodge the question and then he says now I think Argentina will be a good a good new member we'll talk about that but he doesn't mention Iran so you see there is always a uh, this is something going on in the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs so thank you very much uh, for, for this take um, now let me look at my notes again um, so the next person um, is uh, uh, Dr. Hanja Matai uh, former Foreign Secretary of India, who is going to answer the question from an India point of view, how useful has BRICS proved to be in ma managing India's complex relationship with, with, uh, with China? Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Hanja Matai is the former Secretary of India from 2011 to 2013. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1974, and during the course of a 40 years diplomatic career, he served as the Indian Ambassador to Israel, Qatar, and France and as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Mr. Matai contributes to public discourse uh, on issues of geopolitics and energy security. And his commentaries feature regularly in the India media. He lives in uh, Guargan on in India. Uh, Dr. Harjan, you have the floor. Thank you very much for being here with us. I think you're muted. Uh, 
Very thank cool. you. Thank you very much. And also thank you for, for awarding me an honorary degree, which I don't actually have. I'm usually known as Mr. Ranjan Mathai. And right, I must say that, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I have taken the, the subject matter for today as literally as it was given to me, which is managing multilateralism with China, the test case of BRICS, and what is the perspective of each one of us. Uh, and uh, since I'm not now representing the government of India any longer, I, I think it is, uh, gives me an opportunity to speak freely from what I have read and what I have picked up. Uh, I'm grateful to Ambassador Sarkis for having introduced the definitional part of multilateralism, which takes at least one minute out of my presentation, and also to Elizabeth for having brought up IBSA, which I will also then leave out as another example of multilateralism. But I will just touch on um, the definition which is generally accepted that multilateralism is a system whereby countries and groupings coordinate elements of their national policies in pursuit of common goals on the principle of sovereign equality and reciprocity in regard to dealing with the common agenda. While the United Nations was mentioned, it actually developed at a time when the world was marked by great power asymmetries and polarization. Nevertheless, institutions like GATT, which became WTO, were built among countries based on common interests, equality, commitment to reciprocity, and mechanisms for resolving differences. And after the UNCTAD got underway, the developing countries set up the coalition for the global south called the G77, which functions multilaterally. The non-aligned movement was also a classic case of multilateralism. Now, while BRIC got a name in 2001, as we all know, it started as a multilateral grouping in 2006 on the margins of the G8 in St. Petersburg. And finally, in 2009, the first summit was held in Yekaterinburg in Russia. We are delighted with the addition of South Africa that BRIC has become BRICS. And the group has held together despite the challenges of geopolitical and financial economic crises since then, and also a number of bilateral issues which have been referred to. 14 summit level meetings have been held and a great institution of the new development bank has been set up. But there is also an alternate view that the origins of the idea go back to Russian Prime Minister Primakov's proposal for a Russia-India-China grouping, which he put forward in December 1998. Since the BRIC idea and the RIC idea came from Russia, India was initially cautious about RIC and took a look at it. But China was negative, and according to Susan Tapley, quickly sank the idea. At that point, China and the US had a few months earlier issued a joint statement regarding South Asia, in which they claimed to recognize their responsibility to contribute actively to maintenance of peace, stability, and security in South Asia. India quickly dismissed this effort at a G2 as reflecting hegemonistic mentality of a bygone era and completely unacceptable. However, with the noteworthy contribution of Russia, BRIC finally got underway in the early 2000s. And there was, when it finally did meet, there was consensus on what the Indian Prime Minister and the other leaders agreed, that BRIC had a role to play in promoting multilateralism, reform of the institutions of global governance, including the UN, to reflect contemporary realities. By the time of the 2012 summit in Delhi, in which I participated, an emphasis on ensuring multilateralism and reform of global governance, including the UN Security Council, was clearly articulated. You will recall that in 2011, not only did South Africa join, South Africa, Brazil, and India were all on the Security Council. The New Development Bank was initially discussed in Delhi, and a, a task force was set up. And its establishment can be seen as a great achievement of multilateralism. And I think it has to be recognized that the important part of it was that it was based on the principle of equal voting, even if initial contributions were not. And here, I think, was a great contribution of China to the concept of multilateralism, because the contrast with the Bretton Woods institutions immediately became a, a noticeable to the world. The BRICS agenda has expanded considerably with consensus from its initial focus 
on economic and global governance. Today, it includes political and security cooperation, people to people exchanges, and climate change, terrorism, food and energy security, telecommunications, agriculture, quite a transformational agenda. During the Chinese chairship of BRICS in 2022 and the previous Indian, there were a very large number of meetings, 160 meetings in 2022. And I believe South, the South African chair is planning a similar number. But in addition to the expansion of the agenda, there has been increasing intrusion of geopolitical differences into the BRICS debates. In India, there has been a growing unease about this, particularly at China's attempts to push the grouping in line with its preferences. I have not been involved in the negotiations, but from news reports, it, it has been clear that there have been differences over attempts to include in the st joint statements uh, elements about the Belt and Road Initiative, parts of which India views as an affront to its sovereignty. Other members also viewed China's desire to insert language on, quote, non-politicization of the origin of the COVID pandemic as unnecessary and pulling BRICS into disputes outside the work agenda. The border dispute was mentioned, and I think it has become clear that after that Chinese attack, India's determination to resist Chinese attempts to dominate the agenda of BRICS has increased. And the Indian External Affairs Minister spoke to the BRICS Academic Forum in August 2021, where he said, counter dominance instinct and principled commitment to multipolarity in all its forms is written into the DNA of BRICS. During the recent Raisina dialogue in Delhi, I think some of you were there, discussions during a BRICS think tank breakfast gave me an opportunity to listen to other countries. And it gave me the impression that some of India's concerns are actually shared. There was a panelist from Brazil, Renato Bauman, professor from the Institute, I believe, of Economic Studies, who said there was not enough complementarity and mutual understanding, which is an argument against enlarging the group. The argument made by some in favor was that it would reduce the relative weight of China. It is often mentioned, quote, that BRICS is China plus four, unquote. And I believe Victoria was there too, and I heard her say that what has held up to now is that BRICS is not against anybody, and we must now focus on the multilateral agenda. Examining these comments further, it appears that the experience of BRICS as a test case leaves much to be desired. There is an Indian scholar, Dalit Singh, who wrote a book, Power Shift, about India-China relations. And he compared the US role in post-war multilateralism with that of China today, saying the logic for stronger rising powers such as China to initiate a process of sharing power and authority to create durable institutions exists. And I think there's merit in his comparison. If you just look at the figures, within BRICS, 25% share of global GDP, China is 18%. BRICS, 17% share of global trade, China is 12%. Dawa Singh argued that some observers believe that this is a mere temporary expedience before China reverts to traditional geopolitical behavior by steering BRICS in Chinese direction by noting, it should not be presumed that Moscow, Delhi, Cape Town, and Brasilia lack the agency and skill to defend the shared norms that underpin BRICS. There is some evidence of the defense of these shared norms happening in an official document. The BRICS joint statement of May 20, 2022, following the meeting of foreign ministers with China in the chair. In para one, it, the ministers agreed that facing the newly emerging features and challenges, the BRICS countries should enhance their solidarity and cooperation and work together to address them. They recalled the adoption in 2021 by BRICS Sherpas of, quote, the revised terms of reference for guiding BRICS engagement going forward on its working methods, scope of engagement, and the chair's mandate. Well, 13 years after you start, you have to re-emphasize the chair's mandate. While no details of the terms of reference are available in the public domain, Discussions during the think tank meetings pointed 
to dissatisfaction at the failure to maintain consensus on work procedures, including the chair's authority, and on China's attempts to insert issues reflecting its foreign policy priorities into the, uh, into the agenda. Now, expansion of BRICS is something which we are all discussing. It's particularly high on China's agenda. While BRICS has a long tradition of outreach to other members, this is traditionally limited to the summit meetings. However, during the Chinese chairship, in the virtual meetings of foreign ministers in May 2022, China got foreign ministers from nine other countries to participate. At the BRICS uh, summit, which was uh, mentioned, the Para 73 regarding expansion states, and I quote, we stress the need to clarify the guiding principles, standards, criteria, and procedures for the expansion process through the Sherpa's channel, again, quote, on the basis of full consultation and consensus. And this takes us back to the origins of BRICS in the early 2000s. As the multilateral alternative, it was meant to provide to processes of existing Western dominated world order and globalization. There is a belief that China was then a net beneficiary of both and continually increased its weight and role in the major structures of the existing world order. In the early 1990s, China, which declares itself a developing country, associated itself with the G77 group of the South but not by joining it, but by creating a forum called G77 and China. In 2012, Chinese leaders spoke of a new type of great power relationship with the US, leading to speculation about a G2 as a name. I've been reading and I saw an article by Fyodor Lukyanov, research director of the Valdai International Discussion Club in, in, in Russia who notes that it is after the differences with US got exacerbated that China has looked elsewhere. China's attempts in the late 2010s and early 2020s to slow down American pressure have run up against Washington's firm intention to move the relationship into the category of strategic competition. To be fair, China's assertiveness and self-confidence were also growing. But if everything depended on Beijing alone, the period of beneficial cooperation would have lasted several more years." Unquote. In conclusion, the BRICS experience of managing multilateralism with China has been mixed. We had a relatively collaborative experience in the first decade and set up a truly multilateral institution. But today, the BRICS test case is very discouraging. I believe the present world scene of global discord requires BRICS to function effectively with real multilateralism and support for a peaceful and balanced global order. The demands of the global, the entire globe, whether all global issues, uh, expect nothing less from BRICS. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matai. Thank you very much for the Indian perspectives on, on BRICS expansion uh, and for your uh, and, and, and for your uh, very interesting takes on the in the last 10 years of, of BRICS uh, negotiations. So next time you come to Sao Paulo, I will give you the doctorate diploma that I honored you in the <laughs> presentation. So it's here. I'll, 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 I'll keep here for you for the next time. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, our next pre uh, presenter uh, is Victoria Panova, Vice Rector of the National Research University, Higher School of Economics, HEC, University of Moscow, who's going to uh, answer the question, the uh, following question. From a Russian point of view, how far has BRICS, as, as opposed to engagement uh, via UNS, uh, United Nations Security Council, as uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and other fora, shaped Sino, uh, Sino Russian uh, cooper cooperation? Um, let me just uh, scroll down. Dr. Victoria Panova is, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the Vice Rector of the National University. Universe, uh, National Research University Higher School of Economics, NRU, HSE. Prior to that, in 2017 to 2022, she held the post of Vice President for International Relations of the Far Eastern Federal University, FEFU, 2000, from 2001, uh, in 2021 to 2022, advisor to the director of the Russian Institute for Strategic Studies. 
During the Russian uh, Championships in BRICS in 2020, she also held the post of the Scientific Supervisor of the BRICS Expert Council and Managing Director of the National Committee of BRICS Research. For the period of March 7, uh, 2016 to March 2017, she was the Dean of the Oriental Studies Institute of the FEFU University. And prior to that, she occupied the position of the Associate Professor and Deputy Head of the Department of International Relations and Foreign Policy at the Moscow State University of International uh, Relations. Dr. Vittoria, thank you very much for being here with us. It's a pleasure. You're muted. I was yeah. muted this whole time. No. No, no, no. Oh, no. Just, uh, just the last half of the phrase. So you didn't finish it and muted yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Dr. Vittoria, you have the floor. The floor is yours. Uh, be uh, welcome. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Feliciano. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's real pleasure, first of all, to speak in such a uh, wonderful uh, with such a wonderful, wonderful roundtable webinar, a uh, set of speakers, uh, a lot of whom I've, I've known for quite some time and met not just on BRICS, but in other instances and, and on other uh, projects. Um, so really great to be here. And um, I think we've, we're discussing a really relevant, um, uh, very relevant uh, topic because uh, as Mr. Martha, your, your Excellency, as you've uh, mentioned, probably now BRICS is, in some views, is being disappointing. Uh, although I can argue this a bit, uh, because if we compare to the general situation, which is ultimately, utmostly disappointing with regards to global uh, geopolitical situation, probably BRICS remains a safe haven for the countries that are there. And probably this is why we are witnessing a number of countries. Uh, I think Elizabeth mentioned seven. I think there were three official applications and about a dozen of countries that we saw in different ways, either in the news or like with some uh, sorts of um, um, more or less semi-official uh, applications being held. So uh, BRICS is seen as something that could present an alternative uh, with regards to possibility of building a new, safer world that's not rules-based in the interest of just some, but rather uh, based on the centrality of the United Nations. Although as uh, Mr. Martha might remember also, uh, spoke about their uh, Trizina about probably BRICS serving as a new P5 uh, because this gives an opportunity to countries like South Africa, like um, India, who is actually big global player, very important one, not being officially uh, a permanent member of UN Security Council. Uh, actually play a more significant role and uh, demand the role that it really deserves on the global arena with the situation being today as such that, um, I mean, it's uh, very difficult to move things ahead, especially with their UNSC, but probably BRICS is a good option to uh, push forward this fairer multilateral uh, reform and actually allow for a uh, practice in true multilateralism. That is why BRICS probably is not uh, such a disappointed, in my view, uh, entity at, as it might seem if you kind of compare um, with the rest. Um, what is there as well? Um, I would like to probably stress before answering the Sino-Russian um, question, a uh, few points that were raised by uh, previous speakers, uh, like when uh, Carlos started talking uh, in the beginning that probably our societies need to talk more to each other. In fact, probably we would be happy to involve Sabri more into such interactions because we formed, and this is very much counter to what we see with the other uh, many other 
global and regional uh, institutions, or um, we have this network of cooperation and of discussions, uh, not just on the official level. And that's probably what Mr. Mathe have mentioned. Uh, you remember when China is a main proponent of this BRICS Plus uh, today, it gathered no, uh, other non-BRICS countries, not just on their uh, summit, not just for the summit, uh, but in fact, it responds to their uh, desire and to the need of our countries, not just to talk to each other because we have civil, we have uh, academic, and actually academic BRICS has been held since 2008, even before the first summit. So we were even prerequisites, we or, or, or formed the basis on an expert level for the official gathering. We have the business BRICS, we have um, uh, women business alliance, we have uh, parliamentarian BRICS, youth BRICS. So it's a whole set of um, networks that allow for interaction, not just on official level, not just for our leaders to meet and kind of uh, see each other twice a year within BRICS and within the G20, uh, but uh, it offers this not only vertical, but also horizontal flow of ideas um, and ensuring that this um, entity leads us somewhere. Uh, that's that's one thing. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is there. Uh, I think everybody touched upon expansion, BRICS expansion, and this uh, discourse, or let's say not not discourse, but debate or um, in co compatibility of both inclusiveness and exclusiveness, because BRICS indeed it claims and it is uh, trying to ensure that first of all. Uh, it's not against anybody. And this is the primary basic principle of, the co of its cooperation. That's why it uh, doesn't matter how much uh, outside experts have been arguing about uh, heterogeneity of BRICS, about differences that it has. Uh, the idea that it is based on the cooperation of common interests, but it doesn't touch upon whatever uh, differences its members have with outside world or even between each other. Uh, this forms uh, their very firm foundation for its continued functioning. So we look back to 2006 when uh, ministers of foreign affairs and, and defense minister in, in, uh, in the case of Brazil met on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly. And since then, Yekaterinburg 2009, and for over 15 years right now, uh, it did uh, continue not just to function, it didn't turn into talk shop, this is important. It might look like that to some who do not go deep into uh, actual activities, but if you look into what's really been happening, not just uh, official documents, you see uh, that a number of projects are being realized with concrete results. NDB is just one of the instances. It's very vivid. I like to uh, put it as an, put ahead it as an example, specifically because such different countries uh, as BRICS, they, uh, from the idea being born to the actual establishment of BRICS Bank, we had only two and a half years. This is extremely fast. And uh, I didn't see anything like that being born with, let's say, more politically coherent countries, for example, as G7, uh, to have similar type of big project being realized from zero to 100% in, in such a short period of time. So I, I think this is a success and this ensures, and this shows that BRICS are committed to um, going into actual results. Uh, look into scientific cooperation, right? We have uh, in fact a network of the, this STI architecture 
uh, this was an issue and it was very much uh, promoted by Brazil. In fact, it's one of the main pushers behind it. Uh, STI has uh, um, a number of areas which are specifically uh, important for development, high tech and innovative development of each of our countries and where we uh, do go for uh, concrete projects. Um, in fact, I can continue with, um, with such ideas or with such projects, uh, take their economic partnership strategy, right? It looks like we're very much distant from each other, not much in common. China is probably the only country with whom everybody has a big share of um, trade turnover. But on the other hand, you uh, compare figures and their dynamics, and you see that this has changed with a much uh, stronger and uh, space between BRICS, uh, not just with China. Um, as opposed to BRICS and the rest of the world. This is also important, has to be, has to be taken uh, into account. So what about uh, Russia-China relations in the context of BRICS? I remember within one of the academic forums, um, one of uh, the Russian experts uh, after talking to Chinese, they say, well, China and Russia are their, uh, Russia and China are the mother and father of BRICS. Uh, so in a way, uh, those two countries have been very much putting their effort into uh, offering new, new impetus to this um, union, uh, not, or let's say association. Um, you mentioned IPSA, which doesn't include either, but we also have SEO, which became more comprehensive. We have RIC, which became real, and it is very true that Mr. Matha has spoken of China being uh, at some point negative to Primakov's ideas, and uh, it took some time for it to realize, but in fact, RIC is now uh, one of the platforms together with BRICS helping uh, or bringing some extra multilateral uh, weight to uh, smoothing, if it's possible to say so, bilateral problems that arise, right? In, in, uh, although uh, if we talk about the RIC format, uh, Russia was very eloquent saying that we're not going in the middle and there is no way we are um, you know, saying anything to either of their um, participants, uh, but it was also true that we used this platform and it was welcomed by both parties to uh, have an additional platform to talk and to find solutions, be, be them temporary at the moment, but still they are. And uh, that is why I believe that even though some, and we heard it today, some people say that China is probably using or have been using BRICS as a way to hide behind its um, kind of activities and then move to more geopolitically um, assertive role. It looks at the moment that China doesn't, along with all the five BRIC members, uh, doesn't feel uh, comfortable in a role of hegemon. The key about BRICS countries, some of them being stronger, some of them being smaller, is that uh, it is safer and it is more comfortable to um, agree on some on the issues and to go ahead with the consensus among its partners. Because once you become kind of um, not listening to the others, to the other key players, once you just gather around yourself, just a few satellite countries uh, who follow your idea or follow your suit, you stop realizing uh, or seeing the reality. And, and it is very dangerous. And that is why I think BRICS is a very good recipe 
uh, and probably in their future, it could become a point of attraction for one of the West or more Western countries who agree that uh, this multilateralism, multi-civilizationalism uh, and mutual respect are key to, to the new formed system. So I think it could be a point of attraction and it should be one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panova, for your remarks or your more positive views on the BRICS, I agree. I really like your first uh, phrase, one of the first phrases, BRICS is still a safe haven for its members the, uh, on the context. And uh, just a, a footnote, uh, you mentioned that uh, all countries of BRICS have uh, China as their main trade partner and uh, the others are far away on the list. Just uh, during the, a little before the war in Ukraine, Russia became Brazil's fifth trade partner. That was related to the high importation of fertilizers before the war. Uh, but it also shows the potential between the trade between Brazil and Russia out there. So, uh, uh, and I think, and I agree uh, with uh, the Dr. Elizabeth and you also mentioned that uh, BRICS out there, it's a, as a catalyzer for bilateral relationships. So these countries, because they're having meetings so often together, uh, they have stronger bilateral relationship after BRICS, especially from a Brazilian perspective. We never had this close relationship as we have now with India, for example. And I'm sure BRICS is a key element that explains this closer relationship with India. So for Brazil, in almost all regards, is a very positive initiative. So now uh, I, uh, we have our last presentations. We're, keep, we're keeping the people online. We have still 100 people with us between Zoom and, 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 and YouTube. Our last presentation, Dr. Haibin Yu, Senior Fellow and Director of the Institute for Foreign Policy Studies at Shanghai Institute for International Studies, SIIS, who is going to answer the, the following question. How does the Chinese leadership regard BRICS now? Is it as important or secondary? Is it a, a, route for a route for discussions and a resolution of significant geopolitical issues or just a forum? Do they see it becoming more or less central for China? Dr. He Bin Yu is a senior fellow, director of Institute for Foreign Policy Studies and Shanghai Studies for International Studies, SIIS. And Dr. Yu joined SIIS after receiving his PhD of international relations at Fudan University in 2006. Just another footnote, Fudan University is, our one, is one of our partners here at University of Sao Paulo. So we are, after now, after the pandemic, we're starting to resend our students to study and International Relations School at Funda University. So uh, our students are very happy about that. And he's also Deputy Secretary General of the Chinese Association of our Latin American Studies. So Dr. New, you have the floor. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Feliciana, uh, Feliciano. And it's, it's my great honor to join this panel uh, to discuss this important uh, subject. and. Um, I would like to say uh, all, all my thing will be my personal view on this uh, subject. Um, firstly, I want to uh, give my personal understanding about the uh, subject, especially international cooperation and uh, multilateralism. Um, as we all know, the world, this world is, is highly need international cooperation, but, but it is so rare. Um, the reason largely because of the competition among uh, great powers. All the great powers would like to use the competition to defend um, the current um, major players of, of, of the international system. I think this is the most challenging issue. And at the same time, uh, the global south uh, field they were they are they are being overlooked. Uh, they are trying to get at international attention to their development agenda. So in in this in this uh, against this backdrop, I think uh, the BRICS uh, is is getting more uh, relevant to deal with uh, this this situation. And and also. Uh, we all talked about the multipolarity, uh, this new international reality. As, as, I think the a functional multilateralism is to adapt itself to the changing 
international context. And BRICS is an example of, of such adaptation of the international community. So the establishment of the BRICS uh, also represented collective efforts of the major emerging global players to participate in global governance. Uh, so the commentators always say there, it seems that th there are two parallel global forum, uh, namely the G7 and the BRICS. However, the past 15 years of the BRICS agenda shows that the group is not aiming at replacing or challenging the main channel of the UN system or the role of the G7 played in international global governance. So that's, that's my general review about the subject. Uh, secondly, I want to address the uh, BRICS itself. What are the main agenda and what what are what are the, its its advantages, special advantages in the current international system? So um, I, I think the, yes, I agree with the previous speaker mentioned. Uh, both the G7 and the BRICS was, uh, was, was a product of the re, uh, reforming international financial governance. So it focused on the global financial institutions reform, but also it focused on the international development agenda, uh, which is, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's the strength of this grouping. Especially, it focuses on the sustainable development, which is quite relevant for the for today's world and also for for the, especially for the global South countries. So, in order to achieve their development oriented uh, priorities or cooperation, so the BRICS members established the new development bank uh, with a rotating presidency. So the, the priority of the NDB is, is sustainable development and the style of the NDB is also different from IMF and the World Bank. It, it adopted a rotating presidency. Uh, I think this is a, um, also an advantage, an innovation in the international institutions. Of course, the disadvantage of the, of the equal sovereignty arrangement within the NDP limited uh, the, the bank's capacity to collecting, uh, mobilizing financial resources. But quickly, the Asia Infrastructure Investment, Investment Bank changed uh, this disadvantage. The AIIB is more capable uh, by adopting a World Bank style governance structure but interestingly, which also attracted all the BRICS members to participate in. Why? Because this bank focuses on infrastructure. Infrastructure is also a priority on the BRICS cooperation agenda. Uh, and also I want to emphasize uh, another dimension of the BRICS grouping, uh, which is also uh, mentioned previously by Professor Carlos, uh, that is, uh, this breaks this group is a social construct construction result. Because if you look at the past the fifteen years uh, process of the breaks, the grouping is working to build a community of member states, not only by. Uh, meetings of the different uh, ministries and leaders, but also uh, many pragmatic cooperation by, by the involvement of the social and academic sectors of the member countries. So they have uh, established many institutional arrangements of the agriculture, uh, culture, education, health, think tanks, and the sister cities of the local governments. So 
this this process makes the uh, the grouping not only uh, on the financial, uh, political, and security uh, dimension, but also on the social and uh, uh, social dimension. Dimension. This this is quite interesting. So this makes the group um, becoming a community. Uh, this community sense is it is growing. Uh, we, as I think both the member all the member countries are want to identify. Uh, want to show their identity as a member of the BRICS. I think this is a great achievement uh, of, the, of the grouping. And also the BRICS uh, has built an outreach uh, mechanism to engage uh, with the more developing countries. This includes the regular dialogue mechanism with regional countries. Uh, by the hosting uh, hosting countries, and also uh, it it has uh, studied uh, the expansion process by involve by inviting uh, selecting I think uh, four countries as an NDBs new members, but also it is also discussing the expansion of the uh, BRICS uh, members. And also, it has uh, the NDB has established the four regional offices, uh, aiming to aiming, aiming at uh, serve serve a more uh, broad uh, developing world. And also, I want to emphasize the uh, advantage of the BRICS. Uh, this is also mentioned by previous speakers that that is. Uh, this group can overcome their uh, differences to achieve uh, international cooperation. I think this is also very important for today's world because uh, the Western the G7 group uh, want, want always emphasize their similarities, uh, their shared uh, values, uh, this kind of things. But but the BRICS tells another story. That is a different, uh, the countries from different culture, history, social system, development paths, political systems can cooperate. This is also, I think it, it, it's, it's quite uh, uh, important for us to, to observe. And also, so BRICS looks like uh, a neutral grouping. Um, since it is not a, a block uh, to confront con confrontation and uh, it's not adopting a confrontation and the in intervention strategy, and we just to focus on the common agenda. So they, they have they have developed a very um, comprehensive cooperation agenda, not only in the global economic governance but also on the security issues. Uh, they are address, They are discussing um, the visions and the approaches to solve the, the security challenges in Middle East, in Central Asia. Uh, but also, they are focusing on more on the non-traditional security agenda, uh, like the cyber security uh, on, and uh, public health issues uh, during the pandemic era. Uh, the NDB has done a lot uh, in helping member states to deal with the public health crisis. But all in all, all, all the, despite all these achievements, uh, I, I have to say uh, the BRICS uh, real influence on, in the global governance is quite limited. Uh, there are non, many, many reasons, but the potential for the BRICS to play a larger role uh, is quite huge. So my, my, um, my last part will be addressing China's uh, uh, perspective on the BRICS. I think BRICS is just one of the multilateral platform for China. Uh, China has engaged all 
major multilateral uh, institutions. Because China committed itself to build a community of the shared future for mankind, China alone cannot make this work done. So it has to cooperate with others, to mobilize others' uh, willingness and resources to do that. So China needs to work with broad members of the international community. There are different multilateral tools. But as funding members, um, the, multiple, the multilateral platforms such as the G20, BRICS, uh, ICO, AIB, et cetera, in, the, in these emerging institutions, China has a larger chance to practice its vision of multilateralism with like-minded countries, partners. Uh, as to the BRICS uh, cooperation, we can uh, review the three presidency um, initiatives of China uh, in 2011, 2018, and 2022. Um, when China hosting the BRICS uh, uh, chairmanship. So in 2011, China invite, invited South Africa to the, to the table, which makes the grouping, uh, gives, uh, gives the grouping a global dimension. I think th this is quite important for, for the image of the grouping. And in the 2017, the Xiamen Summit set up three pillars of the BRICS cooperation, namely the economics, trade, uh, finance, and political security, and cultural exchanges, which makes, makes the uh, BRICS cooperation a community building. And also, uh, China initiated the BRICS Plus model, uh, which makes the BRICS can be accessible for the, by the developing world. And in two, 2022, China emphasized the high quality partnership and the global develop, development agenda for the groupings. I think this, uh, this is also important for, for the developing world to achieve the SDG in the near future with the help of the BRICS. But but when when very interesting thing uh, for the BRICS exp expansion we discussed today, um, China doesn't worry too much about the expansion of the membership. I don't think China doesn't think uh, the, the new members will, will dilute China's influence and privilege in the group. This is a quite key difference. I I think I hope. Uh, uh, this, this vision can be shared by more established uh, players within the group. So we can make the grouping uh, more representative in the world stage. And uh, come, come to the, the term, the subject of the multilateralism. I think uh, we, we already know there is a debate between China and uh, some Western countries about what is uh, multilateralism. So China uses the term uh, true multilateralism. What is the true multilateralism? Uh, this is uh, quite interesting, but uh, I want to emphasize some elements of this concept. Uh, the first is uh, the multilateralism with BRICS or China style emphasize uh, extensive consultation, joint contribution and the shared benefits. So it, it shall advocate openness and inclusiveness and oppose uh, isolation and exclusion. And I think the, the, the second character may characteristic of the concept is uh, it doesn't against the third party. And the third maybe is also the important uh, thing is, is not about multilateralism, it's, it's about the aim of the multilateralism. It, it should give priorities to the demands of the developing countries. I think this, this maybe help us to understand what is the true multilateralism. But 
as Professor Carlos uh, mentioned at the very beginning, there are at least five uncertainties in the world stage. So that means today's world has changed a lot compared to the starting years of the BRICS. So how BRICS can adapt themselves itself to this new international situation? Uh, as I think um, maybe we should be a little bit still optimistic about the uh, resilience of this grouping. Uh, since uh, we, uh, most of the bilateral, some of the bilateral relationship within the group is quite dynamic. For example, the Brazil-China relationship and also China-Russia relationship, China's relationship with South Africa. Um, and also China values very much India's role in promoting the uh, institutionalized cooperation of the BRICS. So, we, we, are bit, bit, witnessed, uh, we have witnessed the visit of President Xi to Russia, and we are looking forward to Lula, President Lula's visit to China. Uh, these are the important events in, in the world stage. Uh, I, why it is important, I, I think. Um, so why it is, why does the BRICS matters? Because its members matters. Of course, uh, some speakers have mentioned the importance of the uh, access, the chances for the members to regularly meeting Chinese, Chinese leaders. I think the vice versa is also true. So, so, uh, so, uh, so because of all, all, all these reasons, I think uh, the group, the group uh, will becoming more dynamic and promising uh, with China, uh, China's willingness to play a larger role and its uh, willingness to cooperate with uh, other members within the group. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. New, for your optimistic view of the uh, adaptation of BRICS in the last 10 years. Thank you very much. It's good to know that for China, the expansion of BRICS does not necessarily is not necessarily seen as the diluted uh, 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 Chinese influence in the, in the groups, which is uh, good to know. So now I think we reached to a, a key point of our uh, of our discussion here. We're going to open the floor to all members to make questions, to make comments on each other's presentations on the issues. I, I think Ambassador Sarkis is about to leave, so I think we could start with Ambassador Sarkis. Uh, Final words, just to. Thank you, Feliciano. Due to uh, unforeseen uh, ministerial commitments, I, I, will, I will have to leave, unfortunately. Uh, I, I thank you for inviting me. I think many of us emphasize uh, issues about legitimacy, legitimacy, inclusivity versus exclusivity. I would say that even truly multilateral institutions, uh, they have concerns of this sort, uh, the UN with the UN Security Council, uh, for instance. And th this is why the idea of reforming multilateral institutions is key. And the groups such as G7, BRICS, G20, IPSA, and others are a part of the process, part of the multipolar multi evolving configuration uh, of the international uh, community. I myself, I think it's fundamental to consider working principles of multilateralism, uh, namely inclusivity, uh, so that everybody uh, has a chance to be on board and is being listening, listening to, and so on and so forth. Plurality, because when we say inclusivity, it doesn't mean identity. It doesn't mean uh, equality, equivalence in values and, and, and other uh, motivations and so on and so forth. So inclusivity, plurality, uh, the notion of dialogue, the principle of dialogue uh, with plurality and inclusivity and the willingness to cooperate. Cooperation is a fundamental principle of the charter. I mean, these principles, they are 
key pillars of multilateralism. And I also think it's part of some of these groups, uh, the BRICS in particular, as a more heterogeneous group uh, than G7, uh, has, I think, these principles ingrained. Uh, of course, it's a process, it's a historical construct. And I think Elizabeth mentioned the Bali declaration of the G20 as a successful outcome. I think she's right. It was thanks to those principles, principles of inclusivity, the idea of not canceling Russia from the G20, having Russia on board, accepting plurality, even in the hardest moments, because you have eventually to show you are responsible. When you say you are part of G20, you have systemic responsibilities. And your responsibilities are very much related to dialogue uh, in a pluralistic manner and to cooperate. And this is why I would focus on economic cooperation, uh, development as uh, the focus of G20 and BRICS. Uh, by continuing to do so, reforming multilateral institutions, strengthening the multilateral institutions through cooperation, dialogue, this is somehow also a contribution to peace, uh, to finding solutions. So this is my, my, my final message. I'm afraid I have to leave you. Uh, it's been uh, a fantastic opportunity to exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sarkis. It's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we'll see again each other in many seminars here. Thank you. So now, as I mentioned, it is, it is uh, 10.50 here in Brazil. So we still have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one hour and 10 minutes for the, for the discussion total. Uh, we don't need to use the entire uh, an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, I have made some, a couple of questions, but maybe uh, Sir Oliver Litwin wants to, uh, to, to start. Uh, this is one of the organizers and make general comments or questions to the, to the presenters. And then I, I'll give the word to Professor Carlos Milani. We started and then we go uh, back. Uh, well, I, I don't want to make uh, uh, comments, but I would like to uh, raise a, a question. I, I hope you'll allow me to disrupt a bit your, your uh, uh, agenda if I um, direct my questions, particularly at, uh, at uh, Ranjan and Nu, uh, uh, to pursue what I think was a, a, a revealed as a very interesting difference of perspective I'd like to try to understand more um, I mean it, um, it it's it's clear that both of you see BRICS as having a potential for uh, being a, uh, a a useful um, uh, organization for um, uh, advancing uh, areas of common interest and um, including particularly reform of institutions and, and, and achievement of SDGs and so on. Uh, it's also clear that, um, uh, the, the, there's a difference, uh, perspective in the sense that, um, uh, China is, is as, uh, Ranjan was pointing out, in many ways, uh, um, though not always, significantly larger than uh, the other uh, members. Uh, obviously, in population, India and China are roughly uh, comparable uh, and are each much larger than the other members. But in terms of uh, uh, China's economy, its uh, trading power, and, and in other respects, it is uh, significantly larger than the than the other members. Um, and uh, I had very strongly the sense, uh, Ranjan, and what you were saying, that you see a, an issue in BRICS being the question of how to maintain uh, uh, the, the, what some speakers have called genuine multipolarity, what others have talked about in terms of um, uh, equality uh, between the members, under circumstances in which there's this is great big um, Chinese economy and the smaller other economies uh, involved. 
Um, uh, and and my question really is, first of all, to Ranjan, have I correctly understood the the essence of what you see as as creating the tension within BRICS, namely the asymmetry, asymmetry essentially of economic power? And secondly, to new, uh, do you recognise that as an issue? And if so, what is it that China sees as a way of uh, helping to resolve that issue as BRICS moves forward? Thank you, sir okay. Oliver. Um, let me. Let, I think I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. New, who received a direct a, a questions, and then I'll, I'll pass back to Professor Carlos. Uh, Dr. Uh, New, you're could, muted. Could we just could we just hear from Ranjan as well? About is, is that possible? Oh, okay. Yeah, whether whether I've correctly sorry, identified. Yes, because I wanted to make sure I've correctly identified what he sees as the tension before we ask uh, New to uh, <laughs> to explain how to resolve it. No, if I, uh, you know, I, I, thank you. I was looking at the the processes by which BRICS functions uh, as a multilateral institution, which I thought was the aim of the the, the seminar, as much as the substance and the outcomes of uh, how. Do I mean this question can be raised at every single one of us? If you are holding a seminar on managing multilateralism with India or with Brazil or with South Africa, you'd have similar kinds of uh, question marks raised, I, I would imagine. But this one was about managing multilateralism with China. So on processes, and I did mention that the relative experience in the early phase was different from what is emerging in the last few years. And the specifics I cited of what all agreed um, both in the in the Beijing Declaration and in the Sherpa's uh, document, that you need to keep certain rules of the game, and you cannot deviate from them uh, in managing a multilateral institution. So the asymmetry is not of itself uh, important. It was important as a contributor to success, as I mentioned in the New Development Bank. Uh, when we agreed on equal voting shares. Now, similarly, if you want to reform the United Nations, you will have to look at greater uh, re reform and greater equality among members. So that's why I didn't get into the debate about the UN at all, or the UN Security Council. I used examples of multilateralism where countries react, act on the basis of equality and reciprocity of treatment with mechanisms for you know managing any differences of, of opinion or, or view so that that is really the perspective from which i was speaking uh, not about the, the the substance of the outcomes i think uh, from the indian perspective i don't speak as an official any longer but uh, given the discussions you hold with people you get the impression that this is a very significant body and can contribute uh, must contribute to a greater global order, and particularly to give Global South a greater voice in international affairs. So to that extent, I, I, would, I would say that. But if processes are not followed, I mean, the mandate of the chair is not always honored, then one begins to have certain question marks about managing multilateralism. That is where I, my views are coming from. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matai. Dr. New, you have the floor. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Letvin's comments and questions. Uh, yes, I, I, China, you, you, you mentioned that both China and India has a sizable economy and population. Uh, which is a great advantage for for the group because you cannot just uh, uh, provide a solution to a small portion of population. I think this is quite uh, reminding me uh, some uh, some ideas about the uh, modernization with the Chinese character characteristics. This, well, this concept was raised by the 
uh, 20th Congress of the CPP. Uh, one of the elements uh, of the Chinese modernization, it, it, it is based on a huge population. I think this is not just meaningful for China, but uh, also very meaningful for the global South because most of the global, global South uh, major economies owns a huge population. Sometimes these populations has very little uh, training of education and healthcare, these kind of issues. So it seems a burden for the national development. So they are pessimistic about their future to achieve modernization. But both China and India's successful example showed them societies, countries with huge population, they can make great development achievements if they uh, have a proper, uh, their own approach, workable approach to achieve that. So I think this is quite, quite important. So I, I don't, so based on this um, context, I think uh, China's economy advance and is not a problem for the grouping, but an advantage for the grouping, uh, especially, especially considering the current deglobalization trend uh, in the trans North Atlantic countries. They are trying to adopt uh, some autonomy, uh, near shoring, uh, localization of their industrial. Uh, chains, which is not a good news, uh, not is a good news for the developing world. The developing world is still looking for capital, knowledge, and technology from the developed world. But the develop, developed world want to maintain their uh, superiority in the economic industry and the technological sectors by, uh, by stopping share uh, their, their resources to, to the emerging players in the developing world. So, so I think it's, at least within the, group, the BRICS grouping, China can share its market technology and capitals with the developing countries. And also at least, at least the members of the BRICS. So that's why there will be a huge delegation from Brazil to China. Why? If you can compare President Lula's visit to US and to China. Correct. Yeah. That's, that's the reality. That, that is why uh, China doesn't treat its, uh, its superiority of the economy as a problem or challenge. And uh, I, I'd also like to respond to uh, Minister uh, Matai's um, comments about the how to uh, keep the certain rules of the game uh, constant, constantly. Uh, yes, there, the situation in the early stage and the current stage of the BRICS is, is quite different. Um, but we have to remind, uh, remember uh, that the equal voting arrangement of the NDP uh, was based on the consensus of the members. But if you look at the UNSC reform, there is no consensus among the five prominent members. So that's why the BRICS adopt a very uh, not, not clear language by seeing that the group encouraging and support uh, the countries of India, Brazil, and South Africa to play a larger role in the UN system. Why? Because this is not a thing the BRICS countries can, uh, can decide. And, and also there is no consensus within the prominent members of the, um, of the UN Security Council. So in order to achieve uh, 
consensus within the BRICS group and also within the Security Council members. Uh, I think we, we have to have more um, dialogue, uh, at least within the BRICS, BRICS members and, and also uh, between China and India. Uh, we need to strengthen our political and strategic trust. So that, that takes time. But, uh, but the key thing is that all, all rules are work, are, uh, war and are and will be created based on the consensus building. So the consensus is, is the key question here. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. Now I, uh, I think I'll give the, the floor to Professor Carlos for his comments. Carlos, please. Thanks, uh, Feliciano. Thanks all uh, researchers, diplomats, and uh, from the different BRICS countries. Uh, I'm going to make one general comment, question, uh, which could be answered by Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Matai, and uh, Hai Bing Yu. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. I've studied only five years of exactly. Mandarin. My Mandarin is too bad. And uh, it concerns the, the issue of uh, expansion, right? Because we've been talking a lot about inclusion of Argentina, potential inclusion of Nigeria, inclusion of Iran, and so on and so forth. And Elizabeth has already tackled that issue from the perspective of, yes, we want to be, we want to defend plurality, but we have our own strategic and regional interests. And it's not very clear whether or not Brazil would be very happy with uh, an Argentinian participation or uh, South African would be very happy with a Nigerian participation in the BRICS. Uh, or, uh, I mean, I think that in the case of Turkey, that is more neutral in a sense, but even though there are issues, of course. And, and my, my question is general for the three of you, perhaps, to talk about, well, what, where, where are the criteria for expansion, right? Because we've been talking about this grouping, which is not an alliance, it's not, a, it may be a coalition, if you want to call it that way, uh, it is multipolar. Uh, it is. It, it tries to be multilateral, but it's limited in its membership, of course. But if we expand it to, let's say, fifteen countries, I mean, if we start expansion and, and and if we have the inclusion of four, five, six, seven countries, okay, it's going to be more representative of this multipolar vision of the world and reality of the world, but based on which criteria? Because we have other groupings, right? I mean, we have uh, negotiating groupings where I mean, many developing countries meet and uh, defend their strategic interests in different uh, um, uh, sectors, trade, development, um, climate, uh, if we think of small island developing countries, for example, under uh, the ages of uh, AOSIS, or if we think about G77 plus China, I mean, we have other groupings, but then what would this uh, uh, expansion serve to? I mean, what would be the purposes of this expansion? That That is not clear to me, because the criteria for expansion are not necessarily, I mean, public. Right, they may be uh, discussed internally, but we don't. I mean, civil society. I'm just a scholar, right? Uh, we don't. We don't know that. Right? We, we know what we get based on the interviews and our uh, inside information from diplomacy, right? But that's not part of the of the game of the institutional game. Uh, and because, of course, I mean, uh, we have nuclear powers. We have. Uh, countries like Brazil and South Africa, which have abandoned their uh, nuclear ambition in terms of not uh, civil energy, but in terms of uh, having uh, armaments. And, and this expansion may, may lead to the discussion of this criteria. And I think it's very important because we are, we're not talking about uh, a non-peaceful competition, right? We are talking about peaceful competition. Uh, in, to think about uh, uh, BRICS capacity to contribute 
to multilateralism. And then I would just like to hear your thoughts about that, right? And, and I have a, 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 a precise question to uh, uh, Hai Bin Niu uh, concerning uh, China and Latin America, China and Brazil in particular, because so far it's only Brazil and Latin America within the BRICS, right? But if we take the, the, the Chinese participation in Latin American economy in general, it's true that China has become in the last 10 years or so, the main trading, tra trading partner of, if not all, I mean, 95% uh, of uh, Latin American economies, if we of course put Mexico away because of its uh, geoeconomic, geopolitical uh, status uh, in relationship to the United States of America, but the majority of all other Latin American countries, they have a very, I mean, important strategic trade relationship with China. The problem, however, is that China has been uh, indirectly uh, contributing to uh, a process that here in Latin America we have called the reprimarization of our exports. I mean, we have again. I mean, we have come back to our colonial periods, right? We are exporting uh, primary goods, right? And, and 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 that's not good for our political economies. That's not our. That's not good for our environment either. That's not good for our tropical forests. That's not good for our biodiversity, and so on and so forth. And then indirectly, in a way, if I may provoke you a little bit, China has been contributing to some non-anticipated negative effects in our uh, political economies, right? And then my question is, do you think that China and the BRICS group could uh, think of uh, and craft some uh, economic incentives to, uh, I mean, deviate this uh, economic processes and, uh, for example, uh, contribute uh, through the BRICS, New Development Bank, for example, uh, uh, to the reindustrialization process uh, of key Latin American countries, such as Brazil, Argentina, uh, and many others, where investment in uh, research uh, and knowledge and innovation would be extremely important, and sharing of technology would be extremely important uh, to avoid this maintenance, which is uh, uh, very uh, uh, problematic for Latin American countries as main, mainly exporters of primary goods, right, and, and, and commodities. I mean, if we want to change the, the role of Latin American countries in the international political economy, then perhaps China could have, uh, because of its size, as you recalled, its economic relevance, its demographic uh, extreme importance, China could definitely have a play and 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 play a key role in that in that regard. That these are my two general comments questions, uh, Feliciano. For now, thank you, Carlos. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll I'll give the floor to Dr. Elizabeth, so she she can talk about expansion, and we go back to Dr. Niu about the role of China in Latin America. Dr. Elizabeth, please. Hi, just, just, just to also mention, since uh, uh, Ranjan did too, um, please don't put doctor in front, <laughs> in my case as well. Uh, I should have said that right I, at the beginning. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm giving out PhD diplomas like, every, like but to I think, but, but I think both Ranjan and I are looking forward to coming to the award ceremony. So. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, just on the issue, uh, I, I, before the... Um, before I touch on expansion, I want to make one observation in the context of uh, the extent to which, you know, the concept of consensus, I think, is an interesting concept. Whether it is consensus among nation states, member states, or consensus in a, in a staff meeting, or consensus within, a, within an organization, a bigger organization, it's always an interesting term. Because... Consensus is often, you know, can be forged by really um, debating until the very early hours of the morning. I, I used to serve on a, on a board where the late George Bezos, the human rights lawyer, served, and his approach was that we, we never vote, 
we always seek to build consensus, but by four in the morning, everybody's just giving up because they really just want to move on. And then there is the other dimension, which is that, that sometimes you sometimes smaller states don't feel comfortable in, in taking their positions and making their positions strongly in opposition to a proposal that might have been made by a bigger country. And I think if I if I listen to some of the some of the discussions also on the on the on the in, on on the issue of expansion, I think the sense that I get is that with the possible ex ex exception of China and Russia, the other three, and I, I don't want to talk on behalf of Brazil because Brazil has also uh, uh, just changed administrations and so on. Certainly, even last year, I think uh, both South Africa and India were not necessarily sort of yeah this is let's let's do this let's let's run into it but it was a proposal put on the table and the i suppose the the compromise that 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 was achieved was that we are going the idea is that in this presidency of south africa this year we need to draw up criteria we need to, to draw up terms and reference and we need to consult we need to consult within our countries before we come to, and the process really is in terms of how DERCO is, 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 is rolling it out, is that by the time of the foreign ministers meeting in June, there will be some sense of, um, you know, there'll be a concept paper, a proposal on the table, uh, certainly one that South Africa is brainstorming. And, and I think what is really interesting is that, that, South Af that, uh, that DERCO is also engaging broadly with with, uh, with with civil society, with think tanks, with with academics on on this, and my understanding is that a similar thing is happening in in other in other BRICS um, members. One of the key concerns on the issue of so the discussion about criteria, um, you know, well, do you do you go to expansion immediately? That's the one. That's the first question. Or do you do something like you see in other organizations where people might join as countries might join as dialogue partners or, you know, um, partner countries or something like that. So it's not quite the, the full membership, but it's, it's, a, it's a circle around it. You may have the potential to become a, a, a member. So that's one option in terms of the, the structure. Um, in terms of... Uh, um, uh, in terms of what the criteria should be, now that's that's the big that's the big elephant in in the room. You clearly want to have a degree of of regional representation. Um, there is a conversation about whether that regional rep representation also has uh, uh, has a dimension where the existing members have a say in that. It is clearly also about I think given that the BRICS can play a, 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 a systemically important role in global governance reform. You're probably looking at criteria that would include uh, countries that, you know, even you know, outside of the G20, but uh, or within the G20 that have a global perspective. But now that I'm 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 sort of putting some some ideas out there that um, it's not just about sort of collaboration on South-South, the BRICS's agenda is a bigger one than, than, than that. It is about countries that are engaged either regionally or globally in many of these, um, uh, these debates. I mean, you know, you, you pose, you, you raise an interesting question about, you know, nuclear issues and nuclear power states. You know, I think one of the uh, and, and that's going to be a difficult uh, thing to, to, to navigate. Uh, I think exactly because of the divisions, let's call them divisions you have within the BRICS uh, already. Clearly what has to be also part of the consideration is how bringing in certain countries might change the entire dynamic and focus of the discussions and of the BRICS and of the way in which they have worked out Despite some challenges which have been highlighted today, they have worked out, you know, a culture of a sort of a modus operandi um, uh, within within the grouping. You bring in new people, new countries with with new interests, different perspectives, particular agendas. Uh, let's 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 you know always be open about that, and that also then changes uh, uh, the bricks and the way in which it has worked, and it might. It, it, it might uh, 
undermine uh, the the, co the cohesion, you know, on on the issues that has 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 already been built. Mindful of all the caveats that that we have spoken about. Um, so the the thinking really is that we shouldn't rush into expansion. We really need to consider all of this very carefully, um, uh, because certainly um, it it what the BRICS has achieved thus far, uh, um, in 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 particular areas, may may sort of erode or may become more difficult uh, going forward. Um, let me. Yeah, just on one point, uh, I, th I thought, Carlos, your observation about uh, primarization, uh, deindustrialization was very important because it's obviously very relevant also in the African context more generally and in South Africa in particular. Uh, and, and it's not, uh, and, and it's a number of causes in the case of South Africa, but, but clearly uh, we have witnessed a decline in our manufacturing uh, over, over a number of years, it's, it's, it's much less important. Many industries have had to close down for all sorts of reasons. And so reindustrialization in the South African case and industrialization in the African case are very, very important. They are very, they're part and parcel of the idea behind the African continental free trade area. And clearly this is an area where members of the BRICS, particularly those who are strong in manufacturing, as, as you have indicated, can actually play uh, a role in helping in Africa to build regional value chains. That's what we're looking to build in the context of the continental free trade area. Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth, uh, for your for your talk. Now I got right. Uh, now I, I give back to Dr. New. Please, Dr. New, you have the floor. Thank you. I want to uh, respond to both uh, comments and questions uh, from Professor Carlos about the ex expansion and the China Latin America relationship. Uh, as to the expansion issue, yes, you are right. I am self, I don't know um, what are the uh, criteria for, for the new members. And, uh, and also China doesn't um, publicly support, give, give its support to special countries uh, for, for, for this expansion. Uh, and also if you look at the, the four new members uh, of the NDB, it's also quite difficult to identify which country is China's favorite country. Perhaps it, it, it can be identified with uh, other members of the BRICS. So, so this is very interesting. And why we are talking about the expansion? I think one issue, one, one aspect uh, to answer this question is because of the increasing attraction of the BRICS mm -hmm. for all the developing countries. Mm -hmm. When they were invited to attend the original uh, dialogue uh, by different uh, uh, hosting countries. They know more about the BRICS. They know more what, are, what, what the BRICS is doing because these priorities are also their priorities and the BRICS countries can provide some resources to help them to achieve these uh, prioritized development goals. I think this, this is uh, the expansion uh, to start the expansion process is a response of the BRICS group to the demands of the developing world. I think that this, this is a dimension we cannot uh, overlook. But, but, the, but it's also difficult to say which one is a qualified candidate uh, for, the, for the new members because this is a decision making process for the member countries so it depends on uh, the consensus to make a choice and as, as to the china latin america relationship um yes it, it's uh, it, it is mainly the countries like brazil and mexico have the concern 
of the deindustrialization. I think this concern was not shared broadly by the rest of the Latin American countries. Why? Because Mexico and Brazil have a strong domestic industrial basis sectors, but other Latin American countries, they don't have this. So they don't have the, this kind of consensus, concerns. But, but if you look at the different sectors within Mexico, within Brazil, there is a different prevent, pre, pre, prefer, pre, preference uh, and uh, priorities in developing relations with China. Like the agriculture sector, the mining sector of Brazil, they want to export more and more to China and to India. But, but the people from the industrial sector, they have a different view. They want to export to China, uh, like the plane, like this kind of things, car. But the lack of uh, competitiveness with their counterparts in Europe and the United States. So this is a business logic. But as, as members of the BRICS and uh, at the state level, we, we should do something to, to ease this concern and, and to achieve common development. That's, that's, that's what the strategic dialogue mechanisms between our two countries are doing, are discussing. So they have a 10 years time period of uh, planning for cooperation. I think a lot of the uh, contents of the cooperation is focusing on industrialization, uh, science and technology, innovation, uh, education, this kind of things. But the, the challenge is how to achieve the, the cooperation on the industrialization and the sustainable development. <clears throat> that, that's the real challenge. But uh, the good news is um, even the exports of Latin American countries of the raw material to China, they have more and more ad added values in these agricultural products, not raw materials, but maybe dairy, meat, um, and even uh, organic foods, very high price in China. And cherry from Chile is also very high price. So even the agriculture sector, there is a huge space for cooperation to improve uh, the health, uh, public health standards requirements. And, and the, 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 the other side is, the good news is that China is not only importing products from Latin American countries, China is doing investment in Latin American countries. This is very important because the new generation Chinese companies, enterprises, they are focusing on green technology and they, they have very strong um, I, uh, norms of the social, uh, social responsibility, uh, this kind of things. So this new, new generation companies from China in Latin America is, is getting more and more popular. Uh, companies like Huawei, like the state grid, uh, and DD, it's like Uber, this kind of companies. They are doing a great job in many Latin American countries by creating a lot of jobs and also to help uh, the Latin American countries to improve their um, info, digital infrastructure. If, of course, there are some, uh, some people are criticizing China, are building ports, railway, uh, road in Latin American countries for transport raw materials to China. I think this is a, 
uh, this that's that's not true because the exports uh, the, the ports can be used by the Latin American countries to export to the rest of the world, not only to China. And if you if you look at the uh, long distance uh, transportation system of electricity in Brazil, this kind of infrastructure infrastructure is not aiming at exporting raw materials, but if it, it is to improve the country's energy security and efficiency. Uh, many examples on this on that regard. I think this new kind of uh, investment and uh, technologies uh, are quite helpful for for the region's sustainable development. But the challenge now is beyond the economic logic because of the concerns of the security of the equipment of China's uh, cyber the, the, uh, companies like Huawei. But if you look at the records of Huawei's experiences of 20 years, nearly 20 years in Brazil, it, 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 it serves the digitalization of the country quite well. And uh, if you agree uh, with the uh, Western uh, countries, uh, suggestion to suspend the process of the 5G, adopting the 5G, then you will make the gap, digital gap, larger. But also, this uh, not depends on China's decision. It depends on um, the choice of the, the region. So, uh, and also, if you look at the, make the, if you want to make the country's environment more sustainable, maybe the High speed train uh, railway is a good choice for, for the major cities of, of Brazil, Brazil uh, like Sao Paulo and Rio. Maybe there is a it's, it's ideal uh, for, for establishing a railway uh, like the railway between China, China's Beijing and Shanghai. It reduces a lot of cars, public transportations on roads. But you have uh, advantages in the. It will be a dream in Brazil to have a high speed train between Rio and Sao Paulo, so I could go have a lunch with Carlos in two hours. Huh? But, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but you have a very developed uh, air sector. Air and space, those, yeah. they are opposing these kind of suggestions and ideas. So, so the challenger question now is the political decision of the federal and, and the state. Uh, governments to is to build this kind of infrastructure, like the United States, it is promoting the infrastructure building now. So I I, I think a lot of scholars are discussing why the United States and Latin America lack of uh, infrastructure. There are many reasons, not only because of China's rise, economic rise. China's technology is ready to serve. Your, your aim of the sustainable development. So I, I think we need more dialogue on, on this thing, <laughs> this kind of cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. Just uh, the talk of the time in Brazil is how the BYD, which is an electrical car company from China, is buying the plant, the, the, the factory of Ford. Ford. Yes. Because it was a Brazil's was Ford's biggest plant in Brazil, was located in Bahia State, but Ford left Brazil after being here for 70 years. And now BYD is probably buying the plant to manufacture in Brazil electrical cars, which is something that in Brazil is still lacking behind. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Matai had raised his hand. I'll give the floor back to him. Mr. Matai, please. Yeah, yeah. I thank you. I raised my hand because I thought the question was also addressed to me, but uh, somehow missed me out. Uh, and also unexpectedly, I will have to leave in about 15 minutes. So I would like to just respond to two, three points, but I'll start with the question of expansion, which is where the question was de um, um, directed to me. I think in principle, we do support expansion. Uh, right from the outset, 
of the group, India was keen on South Africa's participation. But the experience of other international organizations, and look, we have stood outside the doors of organizations. Uh, you know, when I was an official, I have seen this process. It works both ways. The, organ the members who are in the group would uh, need to be assured that new members will contribute to, be complementary to the current grouping, which, and BRICS has already built up a very, very dense agenda. And to manage all this is, 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 is rather complicated already. We don't want to further complicate it. But there's a flip side to it. For the country which is seeking to become a, 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 a member of the group, there may be an advantage in going through what Elizabeth called the process of being an observer, a dialogue partner, to absorb what has the culture which has grown up and to be convinced finally that you do want to actually be a full member of this organization and contribute to it. So I think it, it, can, it can work uh, both ways. Uh, I, I just one very brief point with reference to what uh, Professor Hybin was mentioning. Uh, during my presentation, I deliberately did not mention the, the great aim of UN Security Council membership, which Brazil, India, and South Africa share, because we do know that in the meetings which have been held, there was no consensus. So I didn't raise this issue at all. I merely talked about global governance. But uh, it's been a very interesting experience of gathering together what the five members have been able to, to actually agree on it is very, very relevant, I think, to the rest of the world. And here, I think BRICS is of very great relevance, particularly, I repeat, to the Global South, as well as to the managing of multipolarity on, on, on a world scale. Thank you for your clarification. Thank you, Mr. Matai. One of the things that I just occurred to me, which is I think is very interesting, that we barely mentioned the war in Ukraine. Right? This is also it's very telling of what BRICS uh, is about because the, I've been participating in a number of panels in the last I don't know two years that I'm a, the academic director at Severin. In every single one of them, the war uh, since the war is started. The war in Ukraine is a key issue. And that reminds me, uh, uh, Ambassador Minister Jean Shikar from India the other day, he was questioning uh, uh, about uh, the, role, the role of India in the war in Ukraine. He said, Europe has to learn that not every European problem is a world problem, right? And, and I think the fact that we have been discussing BRICS and many issues here for uh, an hour and 30 minutes, and we barely mentioned the war in Ukraine, which is every time on the news, is also telling how the interests of big, big, big countries are, are, are very different from the one in the West in general, right? I think this is uh, interesting. Um, uh, I just want to make a, a comment. I think it's um, recently I, I, I wrote an article for the Sabre Journal with my colleague, uh, the former secretary, Hussein Kalut, in which we defend that Brazil should craft a sort of a sophisticated foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the US-China rivalry. Right, so we are defending a very common foreign policy that many other countries in the world are defending, which is the hedging foreign policy that you have to protect yourself against the negative effects of the competition between these two countries. And one of the arguments we have there is that Brazil should fully become a member of the OACD. Brazil has this particular position on the world stage in which we can be a letter B of BRICS and also be a member, full member of a Western organization, which is OACD, that will also give us the access, uh, diplomatic access to the G7 countries in the level that we now have with India, China, and, and South Africa that we didn't have before. So I don't know if South Africa, for example, ever was con considered to join OACD. I don't remember seeing that for, uh, there for South Africa. China and India did. They are like key partners, but they are never going to uh, become, I think, South Africa as well, right? But Brazil has this uh, opportunity ahead of us as a Lula's government decisions to fully join or not. I'm not sure. I haven't read. I, I don't know exactly what's the government position on that yet. Um, but it is something interesting that Brazil has this opportunity to 
to have a, a to be on the table with the, with China and the United States, with India and, and United Kingdom, and so in a level that almost no other country in the world have. But that has some negative consequences or difficult consequences, which is uh, if we are very close to Western countries, like uh, we have to have we are pressured to have a stronger, uh, like a closer position, a, a position closer to Europe in the war in Ukraine, for example. So whatever position we have with Russia, we all have we we'll have to be balanced between these two. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons Brazil is maybe the one that has more different positions within the BRICS than the others. Is because Brazil has not solved yet its domestic dilemma if we are a Western country or not. We don't know about that. So if you ask a Brazilian if you were a Westerner, they will say, I guess I am, but they are not sure about it. And if you ask Brazilian diplomats if we are a part of the West, they will kind of give you the same answer. So this is a, a dilemma. But Feliciano, Feliciano the, the issue is not only about uh, recognizing yourself as a Western right. Country recognize being us. recognized by the Western countries as a fully Western country, this and that right. has never happened, and I don't see that happening in the coming 50 years or so. <laughs> right? We are the tropical West, right? right? We're the far we west. Exotic. The we far are exotic. west. <laughs> right, exotic West. I was very the other I was uh, in US uh, uh last year. And I was talking to a Portuguese professor at Yale, is a, from Portugal. And I asked him, "Do you?" I mean, he knows everything about Brazil. He speaks the language. And I asked him, "Do you think Brazil is is, a, is part of the West?" He took like thirty seconds to answer. So that that's uh, answers uh, Carlos' uh, question. So do they recognize us as part of the West? That's one of the reasons we went after for the BRICS. I mean, there was an opportunity. We we started with IPSA, like three democracies from the South: South Africa, India, and Brazil. And then there was this opportunity with the BRICS and we should join. So they, India, especially India and China, Russia less, but India and China, they automatically recognize us as an equal from the South in a sense. So, so something that will never receive from the West. And I think that continues to be, but also Brazil has this opportunity now with the OECD. I don't know what's going to happen, but this is part of the dilemma. So sometimes when I explain to my friends at BRICS why Brazil is a little different, it has to do with this, our internal struggles. And also because it's a politicized issue in Brazil, so if we get closer to BRICS or OECD, which is what is the role of Brazil in the world arena? I don't know if South Africa has the same dilemmas, but that's that was one of my comments. So. Do, do you want me to come in? Uh, yeah, Feliciano. Uh, so, so, so yeah, so South Africa has been one of the um, engagement partners, I think they call them, of the OECD. I think our national treasury has found those interactions extremely useful, you know, very important uh, in terms of, of the financial architecture. Um, our perspective has been similar to, to that of Brazil, uh, at least before Brazil put on the table the possibility of joining the OECD. Um, I think South Africa <clears throat> has, uh, has been hesitant, uh, uh, seeing that very much as, and also, also in, 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 in the context of, of um, uh, sort of norms and standards and rules uh, that, you know, you have to join, but you haven't helped to construct and that it is a global north. You know, South Africa rediscovered its global south only after the end of apartheid, of course. I mean, the ANC was uh, at the Bandung conference and, you know, keen on the non-aligned uh, movement, but that, you know, South Africa you know, if you asked the South African government before 94, they would, of course, we're a part of the West, but that was a very particular type of, uh, of regime. Uh, right. And now this is, South Africa is very much part of the global South. And I think the, there are, you know, it hasn't, there's been no formal application to join the, the OECD, although it's an, it continues to engage with it. Uh, it's a very active member of the development center, of course, of the OECD. But, uh, but that's not on the agenda. The interesting thing uh, is that South Africa did apply to join the Paris Club. And that, I think, has a lot to do with the debt issue that we're facing on the continent and South Africa's engagement on that in the G20. So, Oliver, I think you want to... No, no, I was uh, listening with fascination. I, did, I didn't have a, 
I didn't have anything to contribute to that. Yeah. You're the only, only Western, true Western here in our conversation. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel I feel a very odd man out. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> But um, uh, uh, no, I, I think uh, I think the conversation has been uh, very very interesting in in at least for for someone that didn't understand these things it already uh, in uh, in opening up a bit the uh, the nature of the BRICS and the the issues that arise and the, the character of it and the what what it what kind of role it's really playing uh, I think I think actually the, the the most important thing that's emerged from my own point of view is the extent to which I think you all saw the BRICS as in some way or another a counterpart to or counterweight to the G7 in relation to the G20. So this this triangle of, of G7, BRICS, G20 uh, is a very helpful uh, clarification of the of the international scene, I think. I, I more and more think that the, that the G20 is emerging as a as a, a profoundly important part of the international architecture, even though it doesn't have a secretariat and it's it's not a formal treaty organization and so on. It was formed for a special purpose, but nevertheless, uh, actually uh, understanding the relationships between it, the G7 and BRICS helps to anchor in my mind this, this sense of the importance of the G20 and that, that raises a whole other set of issues about how you manage a multipolar world. Um, but uh, so now I'm very grateful to everybody. I, I, I mean, I, incidentally, I don't think we should feel we have to go on with this conversation to the bitter end. If, if, we're, if, we're, if we've reached a natural ending, we, we, we should end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think we're, we're getting close to our... Um, can I, uh, Mr. Can Mata, I come I in again? Yeah, because uh, we are coming to an end, I think. A very interesting observation which Oliver just made about the kind of relationship that BRICS as within the G20 uh, context. I didn't go into the G20 because the subject of our discussion was actually BRICS. But uh, since India is in the chair of the G20 just now, we're in the midst of hearing about G20 every day in the newspapers. And very interestingly, uh, it emerged that at the last meeting here in Delhi, uh, I mean, Ukraine obviously was uh, the, the elephant in the room, which created lack of consensus and so on. But there was another very interesting point that came out that they could not agree on how multilateralism should proceed. Should it be reformed multilateralism, which is what we keep talking about, or reinvigorated multilateralism? So finally, they had to drop the <laughs> reference and just say multilateralism. Thank you. I think we're uh, we're closing to our, we're getting close to our um, to, to twelve o'clock. So I'd like um, two minutes uh, of comments from each one of the presenters, just the final words, and, uh, and then uh, and then we'll, we'll finalize. Thank you, um, Carlos. You can start. You're the first ones on the list. I'll, I'll be very brief. I just want to thank Sabri for the invitation for this wonderful possibility of conversation with uh, different, uh, though converging, uh, perspectives. And I think that uh, one of the challenges ahead of multilateral organizations is if they do not get reformed, perhaps, uh, I mean, uh, there will be club of friends uh, regulating trade, climate, uh, environmental uh, issues and health issues, et cetera. And they are not going to be universal uh, multilateral organizations, right? And I think that is already happening. And I think that is a danger for, uh, I mean, the universal idea of multilateralism, which was born at the end of the Second World War. And I think that is my final message. Let's try to avoid friendship and let's try to reinforce, revigorate, reform, I mean, all those words together, multilateral organizations. Thank you so much, Feliciano. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you for your participation. It's always great. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth, you have the floor, please. I just want to add uh, uh, and reiterate the points that uh, that Carlos had ma has has made. That I think we are already seeing uh, a growing fragmentation of the global uh, system, and I think going forward, there's probably going to be more diversification, uh, rules, standards, uh, institutions, uh, frameworks. And at one level, that might be necessary in in the short term. 
But in the longer term, because we're all living in this world, we're not, we're not, you know, we're not putting up artificial boundaries. Uh, we have to learn how to work together and we need to learn or relearn how the uh, how we, we, we recreate and, and rebuild principles and processes and, and, and ways of and ways of working together even where we, we disagree. Um, and while, and I'll mention it uh, uh, in, in, in closing, I mean, while clearly the war in Ukraine has, I think has created, I think has brought to, to the surface a lot of things that have been there before. Um, I think it has also created an opportunity and, and wars are never, op, you know, should never be opportunities, <laughs> uh, should never be, uh, be presented as opportunities, but, uh, but it, it's, it's created, uh, created a space for us to really rethink the issue of, of cooperation and, and the fact that um, how, do we, how do we overcome uh, 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 these and we don't overcome these 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 challenges and difficulties by by not speaking to each other. Uh, that's one of the lessons that South Africa learned, and that was one of the points that Madiba had said. He says, "I'm not going to speak to my friends. The people I have to speak to is my enemies because I need we need to move forward." And so how do we how do we make that? How do we roll that out across all of these institutions? Because one of my biggest fears for the G20, for example, is that it does become uh, paralyzed uh, uh, by, the, by the conflict, which isn't good for anybody. It's not good for Russia. It's not good for Ukraine. It's not good for the rest of us, and particularly not good for, for, for the global south. Um, and, and so we need to explore institutions and groupings like the BRICS and other platforms that we can find ourselves in, that we can, we can be frank. Uh, and say, well, we we won't agree on this, but and this is this is you know this is a violation of the UN Charter or whatever. But let's 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 actually move forward on these things where we can find agreement. I know that's pretty idealistic, but I think it is it is important. Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth. Uh, now I hand over to uh, Mr. Matai. Please, your final words. Yeah, well, thank you. I think uh, it's been a must. Thanks, Abri, for having organize this with such efficiency and uh, um, finishing it also with clinical timing. Very, very excellent job. I think uh, my final words would be BRICS has a role to play in two senses. For the members, it uh, adds value to their own national interest and membership of a multilateral organization uh, does advance their own interests as well as that of the group. But to be an effective multilateral organization, your group should be able not be exclusive, but uh, in its uh, outreach, but also contribute to global uh, dialogues, global reforms, and uh, the changing of the, the global scenario, which is pretty bleak at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Matai. Uh, now, uh, Dr. New, you have the floor. Is uh, Dr. Victoria still with us or she left already? I, she's I here? She is here, but she's got a camera off, I think, yeah. Okay, Dr. New, please. Uh, thank you very much. It's my great honor to, to be here and uh, uh, share and uh, listening opinions. Uh, my, my message is that uh, BRICS is really a test case for the future order, world order. And uh, the, the cooperation, the quality of the BRICS cooperation shows, uh, shows us the future uh, cooperation, international cooperation should look like. And uh, the emerging powers, especially the cooperation between China and India, I think is, is, is key, not only for the future of the BRICS, but also for the future of the world. And the uh, BRICS uh, is is, uh, is enhancing its engagement with the developing world, but I hope in the near future it has a, it can uh, have a, a cooperation and engagement with uh, traditional powers like the G7, and then then the, the BRICS uh, can be a, a successful story. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. Uh, Mr., uh, Sir Oliver, uh, you want to give your final words? And then go back to me, please. I, I don't uh, think. I, 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 I really don't have anything further to uh, okay. add. So. I don't think <laughs> is Dr. Vittori still with us? She has an answer there. So maybe she left. I think she left already. So in the name of Sabra, I'd like to thank everyone for being here for this wonderful presentation. We managed to keep more than eight. Uh, now it's uh, around 60 people between here and uh, YouTube online with us after two hours of, of presentation. So uh, it's a very, very successful. Three, three, three hours. <laughs> three hours, amazingly. Three hours of presentation. Uh, so it's very successful. Uh, as I as I told you, uh, this um, this presentation will be online on our YouTube channel, uh, Cyber YouTube channel. So please uh, check it out. And uh, I'd like to thank King's College London, which is a great partner for Cyber, the Policy Institute, uh, and also uh, uh, Sir um, Oliver Letwin for organizing and putting together the panel with us. Thank you very much, everyone, and I uh, hope to see you again in the near future. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.